All right, we're back in another Sound of the Battle Cry. And it's been a while since we've done a Sound of the Battle Cry like this, but it's time to do an old show that I actually can't believe it. I recorded this, made the notes for this back in 2015, seven years ago. I made this uh, around the time that this movie for uh, Star Wars The Force Awakens came out. But uh, this applies to, you know, all the movies, all the Star Wars franchise and uh, many other things. So this show is called Star Wars The Force, Chi, Prana, Kundalini Yoga, Reiki, Witchcraft, all that type of stuff. And what we're going to be talking about is uh, it's going to be going down the rabbit hole and one thing's going to build on another. So I, I hope that you would watch this whole thing, that you'd listen to the whole teaching all the way to the end before uh, making any conclusions. And basically what we're going to talk about is that in Star Wars, they have this concept called the Force. And that this, I'm going to give you the um, the words of George Lucas himself and his influences. To talk about that the Force is not just something that is, you know, uh, just made for the movie. That it's actually taken from uh, real life, from outside the uh, silver screen. And we're going to look at where it's taken from other religions as well. This concept in all different types of religions. And then eventually showing how even behind that that there is an evil underbelly to this force concept, this chi, this prana. And it essentially boils down to witchcraft and, and magic. And not magic pulling the rabbit out of a hat. I'm talking about the other stuff. It gets to, to a uh, some pretty evil stuff. And so, you know, if, if you think that all sounds crazy, great. But the reality is, is I'm going to document it for you Throughout this whole teaching, I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you the sources, where it's taken from, and guess what? It's not taken from some fundamentalist Christian. This is taken from people, like I said, from the George Lucas, from uh, Star Wars, from other religions, from even witches themselves, explaining to you what this stuff is. And why am I doing this? Well, because this concept of the Force is taught in these Star Wars movies, and it's sort of, you know, it pushes this idea into especially, especially impressionable young kids' brains. And it gives them a, uh, it sparks a desire to tap into things like this. And this can open them up to, you know, thinking it's good to mess around with occultic type practices and things that we're going to mention in this teaching. And I'm going to show you, you might think that it's silly, but I'm going to show you the danger in it. I'm going to show you the danger in it from their own writings, from the writings of yogis themselves describing a kundalini awakening and the insane stuff that happens. Okay, so please, I'm just saying all that to say, don't just turn it off before you hear. Make sure you hear first before you write it off. Then after, do whatever you want. But you got to have, you got to hear the evidence first. All righty. So, let's get into it. So, around the time that this came out, the uh, the Star Wars The Force Awakens movie came out. And there were some facts about that. We'll, we'll read a little bit about it. Um, at the time, there were there weren't that many films out as there are now. There's uh, nine films out now. You know, there was the original franchise of the three. Then the other three prequels came out. Then Star Wars The Force Awakens came out, started, you know, the other three that came out. But at this time, they said all six films were nominated for or won Academy Awards and were commercial successes with a combined box office revenue of $4.38 billion, making Star Wars the fifth highest grossing film series. It holds the Guinness World Record for the most successful film merchandising franchise and was valued at uh, 19.51 billion pounds in 2012. Uh, approximately $30 billion. All right, so whatever. We'll move on from there. So, you know, and there was some controversy about, uh, you know, a, a, in uh, 2012, Disney bought Lucasfilms. George Lucas sold it off. And a lot of people say, you know, Disney went woke and went broke and totally ruined the franchise. But 
whatever. It, it doesn't matter. The point is, is that it has been extremely popular, extremely influential in the culture, not only of the United States, but the entire world. It has, um, and this whole concept of the force has been introduced to every, uh, you know, a huge portion of the population all around the world. So it's had a very, very big impact. Okay, so it set, you know, box office world record, huge opening, made a lot of money, you know, all that stuff. We'll just skip past that. Let's get into the force, okay? Let's talk about this concept of the force. So, let's get into it. The Force is a binding metaphysical and ubiquitous power in the fictional universe of the Star Wars galaxy created by George Lucas, introduced in the original Star Wars film, which came out in 1977. It is integral to all subsequent incarnations of Star Wars, including the expanded universe of comic books, novels, and video games. Within the franchise, it is the object of the Jedi and Sith monastic orders. The line, May the Force be with you, which has been said by at least one character in each of the Star Wars movies, has become part of the pop culture vernacular and has even achieved cult status among fans. This is it's a pretty funny uh, article there, the way they word that. But anyways, it's true. That phrase, May the Force be with you, a lot of people, you know, most people have heard that. Uh, but that's the point, though, is that, you know, Star Wars introduced this concept, may the force be with you, and a lot of people joke around, but again, you're going to see how this is taken from religious concepts and religions and, and practices in real life. Lucas, now, let's, let's look at, um, George Lucas himself, okay? We want to start with George Lucas, the creator of Star Wars himself, and see where did he come up with this concept of the Force. Let's let him tell us. Well, Lucas has attributed the origins of the Force to a 1963 abstract film by Arthur Lipset, which sampled from various, from many sources. Okay, so let's, so he took it from a, an Arthur Lipset film, and in order to get an understanding of where this is coming from, let's learn a little bit about Arthur Lipset. Arthur Lipset is an avant-garde, he was an avant-garde filmmaker. He was revered by George Lucas and, and Stanley Kubrick. He may be long forgotten, but without him, Star Wars wouldn't exist. Uh, there was a film he made called 21 87. 2187 has a profound influence on director George Lucas and sound designer slash editor Walter Murch. Lucas's aesthetic and style was strongly influenced by it for the Star Wars films and a number of other works, including American Graffiti and his pure cinema short film 61867 14208. Look at Life. His short film Electronic Labyrinth, THX 1138. For EB, which I believe they took uh, that Misfits took their their um, the lyrics for that song from there. We all one thirty eight took it from that movie. THX eleven thirty eight and the feature it inspired. THX eleven thirty eight. Lucas never met Arthur Lipset, who committed suicide in nineteen eighty six, but tributes attributes. Oh, I'm sorry. Tributes to 2187 appear in Electronic uh, Labyrinth, THX 1138, which is dated as taking place on 514-2187. And throughout Star Wars, the phrase, the Force, itself is said to have been inspired by the short film. And in Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope, Princess Leia's prison cell on the Death Star is numbered 2187, a reference to the film by Arthur Lipset. Lucas has said that, by the way, just a quick little side note, one thing that this proves is, you know, in in this movie, that was the first Star Wars film that came out, right? Episode 4, New Hope. Princess Leia's prison cell on the Death Star is number 2187. Now, that was in, we know that that was intentionally put in there as a tribute to Arthur Lipset's film. Well, one thing that this shows you is that, you know, 
they don't put things in films by accident, okay? Everything that you see in films, especially in the background, the, you know, the, the set, the decorations, <laughs> the decorations, you know, how everything is set up in the background, everything is placed, everything that's written, how everything is in the background is put there intentionally. There's nothing there by accident. Nothing is there by accident. So think about that next time, you know, you see a clip and, you know, some people have made a lot of videos about certain symbols or words and things in the backgrounds of films. And people go, oh, well, you know, whatever, that was just there. No, it's not. They put that there. But anyways, let's continue. Lucas has said that the, his... Um, that his use of the term the force in Star Wars was an echo of that phrase in 2187. Quote, by, uh, oh, this is from the film 2187 by Arthur Lipset. This is where he got it from. In the film, this is the quote, many people feel that in the contemplation of nature, in communication with other living things, they become aware of some kind of force or something behind the apparent mask, and they call it God, depending on their particular disposition. Okay, so George Lucas took that, and he, you know, came up with this concept of the Force, and he put it into Star Wars. Now, here's the thing. It wasn't just that, okay, he took that, and then that's how he came up with the whole thing. No, that's not where he got the whole thing. George Lucas, if you go back... Please go back and watch my other video about Star Wars. It's called uh, Star Wars One World Religion of Antichrist. And in that move, in that video, I show you from extensive interviews, written and video interviews with George Lucas, he explains how he took his influences from a number of different religions and, and all these other types of spiritual influences, put it into the films intentionally. To teach certain things. So that's what he did with the Force. And he just, you know, Arthur Lipset's film just helped him to put a name on it. That's it. He's talking about the same concept. But nevertheless, he was greatly influenced by Arthur Lipset. Now, just as another note to this, you know, George Lucas was very influenced by Arthur Lipset. Well, let's read a little bit more about that guy. The end of Lipset's life. Friends remember him taping his hands into Buddhist mantra positions to protect him from the voices he was hearing and staying up all night listening to the refrigerator or the static between radio stations. A compulsive collector of objects fascinated with the Tibetan Book of the Dead and 16th century Latin texts. He had turned his house into a living sculpture inspired by Dada artist Kurt Schwitter Mersbau. Now, does that sound uh, unusual to you? That this guy's taping his hands into mantra positions, hearing voices, staying up all night listening to the fridge? I mean, and fascinated with Tibetan Book of the Dead? You know, so this is the guy that influenced... George Lucas's concept of the Force. After his move to a house overlooking an enormous cemetery, Lipset's life story grows hazy. He found himself in and out of hospitals and on and off medication. He briefly returned. He briefly returned to cinema once with an idea for a film on the occupation of corners, but it never materialized. After a series of failed attempts at suicide, what he called his little experiments, he took his own life in 1986, just before his 50th birthday. Very sad thing that happened, but you have to, you cannot ignore, you know, when this happens to someone, they try to kill themselves a bunch of times, and then they finally do, and then you look what happened before, and they're messing around with the book of, Tibetan Book of the Dead, they're hearing voices, there's some really strange stuff going on. Hey, you can't ignore that. And he was obviously influenced by something. Force is outside of his control. As he would say, force. So, something to keep in mind. What else did Lucas base the force on? Okay, so let's continue with this. And, and where George Lucas will tell us that it wasn't just Arthur Lipset, but other influences. What else did Lucas 
base the force on. The idea behind it, however, was universal. Similar phrases have been used extensively by many different people and for the last 13,000 years to describe the life force, George Lucas says, from an interview with Time magazine. Moyers, you said you put the force into Star Wars because you wanted us to think on these things. Some people have traced the notion of the force to Eastern views of God, particularly Buddhist, as a vast reservoir of energy that is the ground of all of our being. Was that conscious? George Lucas said. I guess it's more specific in Buddhism, but it is a notion that's been around before that. When I wrote the first Star Wars, I had to come up with a whole cosmology. What do people believe in? I had to do something that was relevant, something that imitated a belief system that has been around for thousands of years and that most people on the planet, one way or another, have some kind of connection to. I didn't want to invent a religion. I wanted to try to explain in a different way the religions that have already existed. I wanted to express it all. Bill Moyers The psychologist Jonathan Young says that whether we say I'm trusting my inner voice or using, use more traditional language, I'm trusting the Holy Spirit as we do in the tr Christian tradition. Okay, I got to stop there <laughs> before we move on. That is, at, first of all, that's blasphemy. That is not, trusting your inner voice is not trusting the Holy Spirit. First of all, you don't have the Holy Spirit until unless you've been born again. Okay, in case you don't know that. And if you're not a Christian or whatever, I'm just explaining this to you too, okay? Um, you, no one is born with the Holy Spirit in them. That's not what happens. Um, everyone is actually dead in sin, spiritually dead, dead in sin. And, you know, Jesus talks about this thing in John chapter 3, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He said, you must be born again. And what that means is you are made spiritually alive. You are supernaturally transformed into a new person. And when that happens, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside you. You are the temple of God. Now, that is only if you've been born again. Not everyone has that. So if you say, well, I'm trusting my inner voice, and then say, well, he's saying the same thing as someone who's saying, I'm trusting the Holy Spirit. No, it's not the same thing. It's not the same thing at all. And so it's important to make that distinction. And then, okay, so Morris goes on to say, somehow we're acknowledging that we're not alone in the universe. Is this what Ben Kenobi urges upon Luke Skywalker when he says, trust your feelings? Pay attention to that for a second. Um, George Lucas says, ultimately the force is the larger mystery of the universe. And to trust your feelings is your way into that. Okay, I'm going to read a little bit more. I'm going to read to the end before we talk about that, but that trust your feelings thing is a big thing. But he said trusting your feelings is, a big, is, is the way into the force. Moyer says in authentic religion, doesn't it take Kierkegaard's leap of faith? George Lucas, yes, yes, definitely. You'll notice Luke uses that quite a bit throughout the film. Not to rely on pure logic, not to rely on the computers, but to rely on faith. That is what use the force is, a leap of faith. There are mysteries and powers larger than we are, and you have to trust your feelings in order to access them. Okay, so he says this multiple times, okay? He reiterates, he says, you got to trust your feelings. He says it twice, okay? He says, and the force is a larger mystery of the universe. To trust your feelings is your way into that. And then he says, he says there's mysteries and powers larger than we are. You have to trust your feelings in order to access them. Okay? So two times he says, trusting your feelings is your way into that and your way to access the force. Now, what's the big deal about this? Why is that a problem? Well, trusting your feelings is a big problem. That is something that is going to mess you up, okay? Trusting your feelings is not the way to ascertain truth. That is not how you determine truth and the way that you should go in your path. 
um, you will that will lead you in a very very bad direction. You know the Bible says there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And it's similar to this, you know, the saying that people have of the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Just because you trust your feeling if something feels good or it seems right doesn't mean it is. And, you know, you trust your feelings. Well, feelings can change. Feelings can change every day. Feelings can change multiple times within one day. So, you you know, your emotions can change depending on your circumstances. It is very dangerous to... to uh, trust your emotions. That's not something objective that's going to guide you in the right direction. It has to be something else, something outside you that, like I said, is an objective standard for truth and morality. Otherwise, you're going to be completely led astray and no clue what truth even is, what direction to go in. You know, trusting your feelings isn't the way to go. And um, so... You know, the, um, the Bible says that the, the scriptures, the word of God is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. So you're not going to know which way to walk, which direction to go unless you have that light. It's going to light the way, the path. It's not going to be trusting your feelings. Before we move on, one more thing about this, okay? The trusting your feelings and, and versus the subjective standard, okay? Anything that you think that you know, you're trusting your feelings right, and you think it's leading you in the right direction, you think you know something, well, whatever you know can potentially be contradicted by what you don't know because you're a being of finite intelligence. And so you can never know anything 100% sure. You can't be 100% sure of anything. You can't be certain of it. Because something else that you don't know could one day contradict it and totally change what you think you know. And so the only way that you can know truth 100% and know it for sure is to have a revelation from a being of infinite intelligence and omniscience who knows uh, everything. And that's God. And that's what the Bible is. It's a revelation from a being of infinite intelligence he gives you truth and then so then when you read that truth you can go ah okay this i know objectively is 100 percent true i can trust that your feelings you can't your limited knowledge you can't and so that's a, one of the big dangers about that and then the last thing we'll read here is a ben obi-wan kenobi he says from the movie the force is what gives a jedi his power it's an energy field created by all living things it surrounds us and penetrates us it binds the galaxy together no no that's not true that's also false jesus christ binds the universe together he upholds everything by the word of his power by him all things consist that's what the bible says again this is why you need the subjective truth this isn't some you know mystical force that binds everything together it's jesus christ the word of god okay but he what's interesting though is he says the force is what gives a jedi his power it's an energy field created by all living things okay so a lot of times in this in the movie and then in other religions they talk about this energy right and even sometimes you talk to a witch, they'll say that when they do magic, that that is manipulation of energy. A lot of them think they're just dealing with energy. You know, and of course, some believe in this, in, uh, you know, evoking and in invoking spirits and, and angels and all this stuff. But a lot of times they'll talk about energy. Okay, so this pops up over and over again. Pay attention to that energy because it's not actually energy. That's the deception, okay? The deception is calling, okay, it's calling something that's not good by another name to make it appear more, uh, less dangerous. That's really the, the core issue of what we're dealing with here. Okay, is that you're dealing with something that is very bad, very evil, but you call it by other names to make it seem like it's not a threat. Called energy, you call it the force, 
I mean, what's so threatening about the force? Oh, the force. It's just a force out there. It's an energy field that surrounds everything. And oh, and you can tap into it and use it for good or for bad and all this stuff. It doesn't seem to, you know, the only negative thing that's ever said is the dark side, but we'll get into that. But other than that, it's just some innocent name that they give it. We're going to see later it's not so innocent. But anyways, that's where they that's where Lucas came up with this. Okay, so he took from different religions and he said, trust your feelings to get into that. Now, let's move on to some of these concepts. This concept of the force is in multiple different religions, belief systems, okay? And we're going to cover a bunch of different ones. And so um, you're going to see the common commonalities between all of these. You're going to see how it's all talking about the same thing. It's just described in different ways and using different names to describe the same thing. That's it. First one we'll look at is ether. According to ether, according to an ancient medieval science, ether is also spelled ether, ether, also called quintessence. It is the material that fills the region of the universe above the terrestrial sphere. This fifth element, or ether, was called by the Hindus akasa. It was closely correlated with the hypothetical ether of modern science and was the interpenetrative substance permeating all of the other elements and acting as a common solvent and common denominator of them. Now, where was that from? Well, that was from the book The Secret Teachings of All Ages by Manley Palmer Hall, which is a, who was a uh, high-level 33rd degree Freemason, occultist, Masonic historian, very well-respected Masonic authority. And he said in his book, he's talking about that ether. And he tied it together with Hinduism and a few other things. Talking about this concept of that ether. Let's continue. Akasha, because he mentioned that, right? Uh, he was the call by the Hindus, Akasa or Akasha. Please forgive me if I don't pronounce things correctly. I'm uh, Not only am I an American, I'm from New England. Uh, you know, you spend your first 20 years of your life in Massachusetts. You get a kind of a weird accent and it's hard to say words correctly. All right, let's continue. Akasha is a term for ether in traditional Indian cosmology. The term has also been adopted in Western occultism and spiritualism in the late 19th century. In Vedantic Hinduism, Akasha means the basis and essence of all things in the material world. The first material element created from the astral world, Akasha or ether, and then they say, you know, earth, water, fire, air. But they include that. That's why they call it the fifth element. And remember, there was a movie called what? The fifth element. That's what they're talking about. Same thing. And um, and they had that uh, in uh, Captain, um, like I said, Captain America, Captain Planet. They'd go earth, wind, fire, water. And then the other dude would come in and hey, they made him look Indian. He'd go heart. <laughs> And that was <laughs> that was the fifth element. Okay? Same thing. Which, by the way, that was like bankrolled by Ted Turner, the one guy who wants to kill a lot of people. Uh, population reduction. He funded the, uh, what's it called? Captain Planet, pretty sure. But he, he, he's, he was, uh, someone ran, a reporter ran up to him. And he's like, you, you, uh, you know, you were advocating one child policies like China, blah, blah. And he said, yeah, that's right. One child policy for the next 100 years, forcing parents to only be allowed to have one child. And he didn't, he didn't even like avoid the question. He's like, yeah, that's what I believe. But anyways, in, okay, so we already talked about that fifth element. It is one of the Pancha Mahabhuta or five elements in its, its main characteristic is Shabda sound you know we don't need to get all the details of all this point is this concept of akasha that's like the ether in in uh, indian cosmology uh okay the 
Naya Ya and the Vyashika schools of Hindu philosophy state that Akasha or ether is the fifth physical substance, which is the substratum, substratum of the quality of sound. It is the one eternal, all-pervading physical substance which is imperceptible. Okay, so that's that concept, and that's in uh, Hinduism. Okay, so ether, akasha, we got that. Let's move on to the next one. Vril. Some people might have heard of this before. If you have stud, if you've done any study about uh, Hitler and World War II, the Nazis, all that stuff then you probably came across this stuff. But I'm going to give you some specifics. Maybe you haven't read before. Maybe you have. Let's see. Vril. The Coming Race is an 1871 novel by Edward Bulwer-Lytton. If you don't know about that guy, go look him up. Very interesting. Uh, Anyways, Edward Bulwer-Lytton reprinted as Vril, The Power of the Coming Race. Among its readers have been those who have believed that its account of a superior subterranean master race in the energy form called Vril is accurate to the extent that some theosophists, notably Helena Blavatsky, William Scott Elliott, and Rudolf Steiner, accepted the book as being at least in part based on occult truth. Yes. Okay, so... Uh, H.P. Blavatsky and Rudolf Steiner were most certainly occultists. And they said, at least in part, this book, The Coming Race by Edward Bulwer-Lytton, was based on the occult. And it absolutely was. Uh, Oh, man, I just remembered. I had read something recently about this. And I I, I got to look it up again. But it was about this guy, Edward Bulwer-Lytton. And I'm, it proved some insane stuff about this guy. He definitely had the knowledge of the occult. And he basically was trying to, you know, he was uh, explaining things in a way that wasn't as straightforward as just coming out and saying it. But anyways, the Order of the Golden Dawn also spoke of the real force. You don't know who about, about the Golden Dawn, who they were. That was the secret society. Aleister Crowley was a part of them. Other people... Um, actually, even friends of C.S. Lewis were a part of the Golden Dawn. In case you didn't know that, we could do another show on that. Look up uh, look up C.S. Lewis' Friends the Inklings. You'll find out. Let's continue. Hitler was also a member of another esoteric secret society. Secret society, the Luminous Lodge, or Vril Society. Vril was the name given by the English writer, Lord Bulwer-Lytton, to the force which he claimed awakens people to their true power and potential to become supermen. Which, by the way, that's where that concept comes from, Superman. Like this superhero, you know, there is Uberman and all this stuff. And it all goes back to these types of concepts. Uh, Now, you know, it's kind of funny because... A lot of old superhero comics, they would have the American superheroes fighting Nazis and stuff like that. But what's funny about that is we, in um, Operation Paperclip, brought Nazi scientists over to our country and helped to f- help use them to help form NASA and the CIA. So, kind of funny. But anyways, let's continue. Plot summary... The novel centers on a young, independently wealthy traveler who accidentally finds his way into a subterranean world occupied by beings who seem to resemble angels and call themselves Vrilia. Weird name. The hero soon discovers that the Vrilia are descendants of an antediluvian civilization, pre-flood, who live in networks of subterranean caverns linked by tunnels. Sounds like giants. It is technologically supported... It is a technologically supported utopia, chief among their tools being the all-permeating fluid called Vril, a latent source of energy that is spiritually elevated hosts are able to master through training of their will. What does that sound like? The Force. Jedis. To a degree which depends upon their hereditary constitution. Yeah, that's that's very interesting too. Talk about bloodlines, hereditary constitution. You know, because in witchcraft, there's a difference between 
an independent practitioner, and a generational witch. Bloodlines. To a degree which depends on the hereditary constitution, giving them access to an extraordinary force that can be controlled at will. The powers of the will include the ability to heal, change, and destroy beings and things. The destructive powers in particular are awesomely powerful, allowing a few young Vrilia children to wipe out entire cities if necessary. It is also suggested that the Vrilia are fully te telepathic. So remember, this is all from this novel that Edward Bulwer Lytton wrote. The narrator, this sounds like he's writing about Jedi, right? Sounds just like these are Jedi warriors, and they're called Vrilia. The opposite of real, no. All right, that was a dad joke. The narrator states that in time, the Vrilia will run out of habitable places, habitable spaces underground and start claiming the surface of the earth, destroying mankind in the process if necessary. Vril, okay, so the concept of Vril in the novel. We'll read that and then we'll move on to the next section. The uses of Vril in the novel amongst the Vrilia vary from destruction to healing. According to Z, the daughter of the narrator's host, Vril can be changed into the mightiest agency over all types of matter, both animate and inanimate. It can destroy like lightning or replenish life, heal or cure. It is used to rend ways through solid matter. Its light is said to be steadier, softer, and healthier than any than that from any flammable material. It can also be used as a power source for animating mechanisms. Vril can be harnessed by the use of the Vril staff or mental concentration. Uh, okay, and last is a Vril staff. I was <laughs> that's funny. I was just about to ask, well, what is the Vril staff? <laughs> I have it in the notes. A Vril staff is an object in the shape of a wand or staff which is used as a channel for Vril. The narrator describes it as hollow with stops, keys, or springs in which Vril can be altered, modified, or directed to either destroy or heal. The staff is about the size of a walking stick but can be lengthened or shortened according to the user's preferences. The appearance and function of the Vril staff differs according to gender, age, blah, blah, blah. Some staves are more potent for destruction, for healing. Staves for children says to be much simpler than the same, blah, 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 blah. Who cares? All right, that's from the novel. Uh, before we move on to the next section. All right, so Vril. Very interesting, isn't it? That is uh, from that novel. And like I said, this concept of this Vril energy. Let's go back there to uh, Hitler. What's say about Hitler? Uh, he was in another, you know, they talk about the Thule Society and all this stuff, right? But there's the Luminous Lodge or Vril Society Hitler was a member of. And why were they part of this Vril Society and then this dude, Bower Lytton, wrote this novel talking about Vril? Don't you think that's strange? Why are they making a secret society with the name of a, of a force taken from a novel? And they took that stuff very seriously. I don't know if you've ever studied the Nazis and the occult. They took this stuff very seriously. The Black Flame and all that stuff. Weeblesburg Castle, Himmler, all that stuff. You look all that stuff up, you know what happened there. They were doing all a very evil stuff. They, and it, it doesn't matter if you don't believe in it. They believed in it very, very much. So, let's continue. Next, Ki, Chi, Prana. All about, this is all, you know, yeah, and before we move on, actually, yeah. So, we got Ether, Akasha, Vril. What is this? All the Force. Same thing as the Force. Next is Ki, Chi, Prana, again. More stuff describing just like the force. All right, key. In traditional Chinese culture, key or qi about the sound, blah, 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 is an active principle forming any part of any, forming part of any living thing. Key literally translates as breath, air, gas, figuratively as material energy, life force, or energy flow. You're going to see that over and over again. Life force and energy. 
Key is the central underlying principle in traditional Chinese medicine and martial arts. Exactly. It do, and that's the thing. It does. They you talk about this, um, this key or this chi in a lot of these martial arts that come that are Chinese, and uh, like you said, medicine. And you know that's why it's dangerous to get involved with some of that stuff. I believe there's nothing wrong with using herbs and those types of things, but. When you have these things that talk about energy, anything that talks about energy, ki, chi, all this stuff, you don't want to mess with any of that. And I'll show you why. Whether it's martial arts, healing, or anything else. Concepts similar to ki can be found in many cultures. For example, prana in the Hindu religion, chi in the Igbo religion, numa in ancient Greece, mana in Hawaiian culture, lung in Tibetan Buddhism, rua in Hebrew culture, and, and you know, they're kind of, this is kind of loose using the word talking about spirit, right? But anyways, this energy thing, vital energy in Western philosophy, some elements of key can be understood in the term energy when used by writers and practitioners of various esoteric forms of spirituality and alternative medicine, right? Elements of the key concept can also be found in Western popular culture, for example, the Force in Star Wars. <laughs> you know, and uh, you can find that, like, people just write this. Like, this was an article in Wikipedia, and they're like, yeah, this is also in the Force. It's the same thing as key. And they just say it right there, prana key. That's like the Force. Here's the next one. Prana. I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on this. It's important. Prana is the Sanskrit word for life force or vital principle. In Hindu philosophy, including yoga, Indian medicine, and martial arts, the term refers collectively to all cosmic energy permeating the universe on all levels. Prana is often referred to as the life force or life energy. It also includes energies present in inanimate objects. In the literature, prana is sometimes described as originating from the sun and connecting the elements of the universe. This life energy has been vividly invoked and described in the ancient Vedas and Upanishads. Sorry if I'm butchering these words here. Okay, so prana is the life force in Hindu philosophy. And again, this is they talk about it in yoga, in the medicine, in martial arts, all these things. Cosmic energy. In living beings, this universal energy is considered responsible for all bodily functions through five types of prana. All bodily functions, collectively known as the five vayus or vayus. Uh, Ayurveda, okay, so the, the Ayurvedic medicine, again, Ayurveda, Tantra, Tibetan medicine, all described prana. Va Vayu as the basic value from which all other values arise. Okay, so it's tied together with all, all these different things, these practices. Indologist George Feuerstein explains the Chinese call it Chi, the Polynesians Mana, the American Indians Orenda, and the ancient Germans Odd. It is an all pervasive organic energy. Over and over again, saying all these cultures. We're talking about the same thing. The ancient concept of prana is described in many early Hindu texts, such as the Upanishads and Vedas. The concept is elaborated upon in great detail in the practices and literature of Hatha Yoga, Tantra, and Ayurveda. Okay, we're going to go to Hatha Yoga next, and that's going to show us some crazy stuff. Uh, so, and you know, we're going to talk about yoga, Hatha yoga, because that became so popular. It is so popular today. It's not even, it's, it's like, uh, you know, it's like you go down the street and you see a Walmart and then right next to it's a yoga place. Like that's how common it is. It's everywhere. And it didn't always used to be that way. It didn't. Before the 60s, it wasn't like that. But uh, a lot of things change, and you know there was all the explosion of the cultural counter-cultural upheaval, and all that stuff brought that in. But the point is here, 
is that yoga became normalized. They're like, oh, it's just stretching. It's a form of exercise and blah, blah, blah. But it, it's not at all. It's not just stretching. It's always been a, a religious practice for a specific purpose. It's always been that way. And the movements are designed for a specific thing. It's a fact. And you can try to deny it all you want, as professing Christians love to, because they're Christians that want to do yoga too. And like, well, I can't do regular stretching. I have to do yoga. It helps me with flexibility. Dude, you can stretch. Trust me. There's plenty of stretches you can do that aren't yoga. It's uh, pretty silly. But let's talk about this. Because you might say, well, who cares? Whatever. Just let him do it. It's yoga. It's just stretching. Well, you're going to find out. Hatha yoga is a branch of yoga. The word hatha, literally force. Hatha means force. I mean, you can't make this up. Force denotes a system of physical techniques supplementary to a broad conception of yoga. Hindu tradition believes that the deity Shiva himself, also known as the destroyer or transformer, is the founder of Hatha yoga. For some reason, his statue also loves hanging outside the CERN facility where they smash particles together. I don't know why they put that out there. And he's called the Destroyer. It's kind of weird. In the 20th century, Hatha Yoga, particularly asanas, the physical postures, became popular throughout the world as a form of physical exercise and is now colloquially termed as simply yoga. Oh, it's, yeah, it's not Hatha Yoga. It's just yoga. It's just yoga, guys. Hatha Yoga consists of eight limbs focused on attaining Samadhi. Okay, now let's take a look at this. Because these postures were designed for a specific thing. Hatha Yoga consists of eight limbs focused on attaining Samadhi. It was supposed to be you do the different postures to obtain this specific state Samadhi, what is it? A state of meditative consciousness. That's what it's designed to do. To put you in the state of meditation. Please go back and watch my video I did called uh, The Dangers of Altered States of Consciousness. I talk about meditation in there. I talk about drugs and meditation and all this stuff. But meditation and putting you in these in trance states, right? I talk about that. And... This is designed to put you in that state of mind. And it's not its not a, a, a good thing. Not something you want to do. But anyways, Samadhi, a state of meditative consciousness, it's a meditative absorption of or trance. It even says right here it's a trance. Attained by the practice of dhyana. In Samadhi, the mind becomes still. It is a state of being totally aware of the present moment, a one-pointedness of mind. In this scheme, the six limbs of Hatha Yoga are defined as asana, pranayama, pratyara. Okay, I'm not going to read all that. It includes disciplines, postures, purification procedures, gestures, breathing, meditation. The Hatha Yoga, predominantly practiced in the West, consists mostly of asanas, or the postures, understood as physical exercises. It is also recognized as stress-inducing practice. Yeah, they might say, well, they only do the postures. Well, they do the postures, they do the breathing, and quite a few people are in there doing the postures, doing the breathing, and they're emptying their mind. They're entering into meditative states, passive states. Like I said, please go back and watch the video I did on altered states of consciousness. You'll understand why you don't want to be doing that. It's I'm not being uh, an alarmist. I'm not fear-mongering. It's just a fact. Go look at it. All right, let's continue. Pranayama. The word pranayama deserve, derives from the Sanskrit words prana, or I don't know if it's prana, because of this line here. Prana and ayama is translating as life force. Okay, life force. Force, like the force, and expansion, respectively. It is a common term for various techniques for accumulating, expanding, and working with prana. Okay? So pranayama is a common term for various techniques for accumulating, expanding, and working with prana. In yoga, pranayama is practice of specific and often intricate breathing techniques. Many pranayama techniques are designed to cleanse the energetic channels called nadis. 
allowing for greater, greater movement of prana. So they want you to do specific breathing techniques to move the prana around in your body, the energy, the force. Other techniques may be utilized to arrest the breath for samadhi or to bring awareness of specific areas in practitioner's subtle or physical body. It can be used to generate inner heat. And in Ayurveda and therapeutic yoga, pranayama may also be utilized for any number of tasks, including to affect mood and aid in digestion. So all kinds of stuff they say it does. And physical illness, recover physical illness and all this stuff, okay? And, you know, let's finish this section. The Hatha Prada Pika was composed of Svat Marama in the 15th century as a compilation of the earlier Hatha Yoga texts. It includes information about Shatkarma, which is the purification, Asana, Pranayama, Chakras, Kundalini, Bandhas, Kriyas, Shakti, which is sacred force, Nadis, channels, Mudras, which are symbolic gestures, all that stuff. And you hear a lot, you know, what's interesting is that we hear a lot of these things now in modern day society, especially New Agers, obviously, they talk about that stuff. We talk about, but now, like I said, before the 60s in America, this stuff was not common. We weren't running around talking about chakras and kundalini and yoga and all this other stuff. It just didn't happen. Nobody knew what that stuff was. You know, maybe some people did, but not a lot. And there was just a massive transformation. So, anyways, the point is, it's here. So, that's more about that prana and yoga. And again, the reason I'm talking about this is this is all, this is a very, um, much more, this section is much more detailed talking about the prana and Hinduism because, you know, this is where it really comes from. The most detail, the most explanation that the most detailed explanation we have of, you know, getting to the dangers of messing around with this force. Okay, whatever this force is, whether you talk about the chi, the key, and all this, the vril, and all this stuff, when you you there's a lot of writing out there about the prana. And, 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 and things that happen in Hinduism and with yoga, kundalini yoga, we're going to read about that in a second, and the chakras, there's a lot written about that out there. And so that gives us a little bit more insight as to this whole, this concept of the force and the danger, which we're going to be seeing. Uh, one more thing, the chakras. In some Indian religions, a chakra, which means a wheel, is thought to be an energy point or node in the subtle body, not a Bitcoin node. Um, it's interesting though. They call that's interesting though, isn't it? That they call um, they call them nodes in a blockchain. You're running a node. Um, something to think about. Uh, thought to be an energy point or node in the subtle body. Chakras are believed to be part of the subtle body, not the physical body, and as such are the meeting points of the subtle, non-physical energy channels called nadi. Nadi are believed to be the channels in the subtle body through which, through which the life force prana, or vital energy, moves. Okay, so they say the prana moves through the chakras. So you hear anybody talk about chakras... You say, okay, well, I'm all done with this because chakras are what they say the prana flows through, the force, the energy. Various scriptural texts and teachings, well, they're Hindu texts, teachings present a different number of chakras. It's believed that there are many chakras in the subtle human body, according to the tantric text, but there are seven chakras that are considered to be the most important. Chakras play an important role in the main surviving branch of Indian Vaj, Vajrayana Tibetan Buddhism, uh, which has some crazy stuff in high-level Tibetan Buddhism. They're like drinking, uh, drinking out of a skull. What are they drinking blood or something out of a skull? And uh, yeah, it's pretty crazy stuff in that Tibetan Buddhism. 
David Gordon White traces the modern popularity of the Hindu seven chakra system to Arthur Avalon's The Serpent Power. That's right. The Serpent Power. Which was Avalon's translation of a late work. The Satkakrini Rupana. In actuality, there are several models and systems present in Hindu tantric literature as white documents. Kundalini is a feature of Hindu chakra systems. Okay, we're going to get to the Kundalini in a second. Don't worry. So, that's a little bit more about the chakras. Now, one more thing before we move on to the... Alright, we're almost at the Kundalini. Before we get to the Kundalini, what, just a little bit about the New Agers and how they view the chakras. Because, you know, they take a little bit of here, take a little bit of there, Hinduism, Buddhism, all this stuff, and they put it into mishmash, and then they uh, drink a bunch of soy. In Anatomy of the Spirit... Sorry, tofu, whatever. In Anatomy of the Spirit, 1996... Caroline Miss describes the function of chakras as follows. Every thought and experience you've ever had in your life gets filtered through these chakra databases. Now, this is not what I believe is true, but this is what they're saying. Each event is recorded into your cells. The chakras are described as being aligned in ascending column from the base of your spine to the top of your head. New Age practices often associate each chakra with a certain color. In various traditions, chakras are associated with multiple physiological functions, an aspect of consciousness, a classical element, and other distinguishing characteristics. They are visualized as lotuses or flowers with a number, different number of petals in every chakra. And they're always talking about the lotuses, right? The chakras are thought to vitalize the physical body and to be associated with Interactions of the physical, emotional, and mental in nature. They are considered Loki of life, energy, or prana, which is thought to flow among them through the pathways called nadi. And the function of chakras is to spin and draw on this energy to keep the spiritual, mental, emotional, physical health of the body in balance. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. Interpretation of seven chakras. Okay. Uh, actually, you know what? Let's read that. Another interpretation of the seven chakras is pres presented by writer and artist Zachary Selig in his book Kundalini Awakening, the Gent A Gentle Guide to Chakra Activation and Spiritual Growth. He presents a unique codex titled Relaxatia, a solar kundalini paradigm that is a codex of human chakra system in the solar light spectrum designed to activate kundalini through his color-coded chakra paintings. All right. So here we go. We're finally at the Kundalini, which is what we really want to talk about, okay? Now, the Kundalini is all part of this concept of the Force, okay? But this activation of the Kundalini, they always talk about as a goal, okay? Now, you think about it, too. Um, in the movies, like Star Wars movies... They're always training with the Force, and they're trying to get to this point, right, where they become a Jedi. You aren't just, like, instantly this Jedi warrior. You got to train and train and train until you can, you know, attain that state. And it's a state of, of they show that it's not just a state of physical skills. It's of the mind, right? And that's what Yoda's trying to teach him. And you just feel it and all this stuff. Well, that's the same thing here is they train and they train and they train with meditative states and yoga and all these things to achieve this state of samadhi, of kundalini. They really want to hit that. Awaken that. All right, so let's read about that. Kundalini, Sanskrit for coiled one, in yogic theory is a primal energy or shakti located at the base of the spine. Different spiritual traditions teach methods of awakening kundalini for the purpose of reaching spiritual enlightenment. Kundalini is described as lying coiled at the base of the spine, represented as either a goddess or a sleeping serpent waiting to be awakened. In modern commentaries, kundalini has been called an unconscious, instinctive, or libidinal force 
or mother energy or intelligence of complete maturation. Um, okay, so it's called, you know, Kundalini is called an energy, a primal energy, a, a uh, also called a sleeping serpent. wonder why they call it that, sleeping serpent at the base of the spine. Kundalini awakening is said to result in deep meditation, enlightenment, and bliss. This awakening involves the Kundalini physically moving up the central channel to reach within the Sahasrara chakra, the top of the head. Many systems of yoga focus on the awakening of Kundalini through meditation, pranayama breathing, the practice of asana, and chanting of mantras. In physical terms, one commonly reports the Kundalini experience to be a feeling of electric current running along the spine electric current energy this is the force okay continuing on kundalini awakening numerous accounts so what is this what is it uh, described as Numerous accounts describe the experience of kundalini awakening when awakened kundalini is said to rise up from the mulad Dara chakra through the central nadi called sub blah blah blah. I'm not gonna na- I'm not gonna hit all the names. Inside or alongside the spine or reaching the top of the head. The progress of Kundalini through the different chakras leads to different levels of awakening and mystical experience. Until Kundalini finally reaches the top of the head, the crown chakra produces an extremely profound mystical experience, and that's what they're trying to achieve. Okay. Physical effects are believed to be a sign of kundalini awakening by some, but described as unwanted side effects pointing to a problem rather than progress by others. The following are either common signs of an awakened kundalini or symptoms of a problem associated with an awakening kundalini, commonly referred to as kundalini syndrome. So, these problems associated with kundalini awakenings happen so often that they came up with a name for it and they call it kundalini syndrome now what are these common signs of an awakened kundalini i'm going to read these i want you to listen to them and i want you to think for a second about if this sounds good or not here's the signs of a kundalini awakening involuntary jerks Tremors, shaking, itching, tingling, and crawling sensations, especially in the arms and legs. Energy rushes or feelings of electricity circulating through the body. Intense heat, sweating, or cold, especially as energy is experienced passing through the chakras. Spontaneous pranayama, asanas, mudras, and bandhas. Visions or sounds at times associated with a particular chakra. Diminished or conversely... I'm not going to read that. Some uh, sensual stuff. Emotional upheavals or surfacing of unwanted and repressed feelings. Certain repressed emotions. Headache, migraine, pressure inside the skull. Increased blood pressure, irregular heartbeat. Emotional numbness. Antisocial tendencies. Mood swings with periods of depression or mania. Pains in different areas of the body, especially back and neck. Sensitivity to light, sound, and touch trance-like and altered states of consciousness, disrupted sleep pattern, periods of insomnia or oversleeping, loss of appetite or overeating, bliss, feelings of infinite love and universal connectivity, transcendent awareness. Now, you know which one is the only one that they ever mention? The last one. That's it. People say, oh, I had this kundalini awakening. I had this mystical experience. And it's always like, oh, I felt an you know infinite love. I felt connected to everyone. I was trans transcendent aware. I was aware of everything. We're all one. We're just all one, and we're all connected by the energy, right? That's all you hear. But with the Kundalini awakening, you don't hear them talking about all this other crazy stuff. Um. Now, what's interesting about this, this show isn't really about this subject, but when it comes to the Kundalini Awakening, I want you to see, number, go back to number one. It says, signs of a Kundalini Awakening. 
are involuntary jerks, tremors, shaking, itching, tingling, crawling sensations, especially in the arms and legs. Now, to me, this sounds awfully familiar. And what it looks like is um, a Benny Hinn crusade. Maybe a charismatic Pentecostal church where they're doing what? Involuntary jerks, tremors, shaking, shaking on the ground, shaking in their, their the pews, falling on the ground. That's right. Sounds exactly like Kundalini. Now, why do you think there's so many similarities between the Kundalini awakening and charismatic Pentecostal experiences? You should think about that. Let's continue. Sir John Woodruff, pen name Arthur Avalon, was one of the first to bring the notion of Kundalini to the West. As High Court Judge in Calcutta, he became interested in Shaktism and Hindu Tantra. His translation of and commentary on two key texts was published as excuse me, The Serpent Power. Woodruff rendered Kundalini as serpent power, for lack of a better term in the English language, but Kundala in Sanskrit means coiled. Western awareness of the idea of Kundalini was strengthened by the Theosophical Society and interest by psychiatrist Carl Jung. Well now, I got something to say about that. Just one uh, paragraph about Carl Jung. Um, Jung's seminar on Kundalini Yoga, by the way, Carl Jung had a seminar in Kundalini Yoga. Okay? And Carl Jung's seminar on Kundalini Yoga presented by the to the Psychological Club in Zurich, Switzerland in 1932 has been widely regarded as a milestone in the psychological understanding of Eastern thought. Kundalini Yoga presented Jung with a model for the development of higher consciousness and he interpreted its symbols in terms of the process of individuation. Okay, now, this is no surprise if you know anything about Carl Jung, okay? Carl Jung was super into the occult. And not just this, a number of different things, but he did a seminar on Kundalini Yoga. Now, this is something to consider when you think about someone like Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson become very popular in the world. Um, you know, he has a lot of good things to say about responsibility. Um, certain types of things like that. But other things are not so good. Like when he talks about the Bible as if it's a myth. A bunch of legends and stories and it's not literally true. And he's very uh, sneaky about that. And very, I should say, very evasive in, 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 in the way that he deals with that. People confront him about it. But anyways, um, you know, Jordan Peterson has said many times he's very influenced by Carl Jung. Carl Jung was super into the occult. Okay? So, you just got to consider that. Consider the influences. But anyways, let's continue. Point is, we're just talking about Kundalini, right? So let's continue. Now, this is really what we're going to get. This is the nitty gritty here about tying this all together. Uh, because, you know, we're tying together Star Wars The Force and showing that comes from all these different religions and concepts. We got the Vril, we got the Chi, the Ki, the Prana, and tying together with the chakras and Kundalini, right? It's all tied together. It's all the force. This is all the force. Now, showing you that it's not just in a movie. People actually believe in these things and do practices within their religions that's related to this concept of the force that they believe in. And it doesn't matter what they call it. It doesn't matter if they call it prana, kundalini, whatever it is. It's still the same type of force thing. It's invisible force. Now, we looked at all that, but now what we're going to see is the danger, okay? I want you to see the danger. We saw a little bit. 
We saw a preview, a little bit of a glimpse when we saw about, the, you know, the symptoms of a kundalini awakening as they're shaking and tremors and fevers and all kinds of crazy stuff. But this gets even way crazier, okay? And what I have here as well is I am reading, going to be reading to you from primary sources, first-hand experiences of Hindu practitioners, yoga practitioners from India, okay? Not Christian sources, not someone coming up with a crazy story to sensationalize and fear monger, but this is just straight from the horse's mouth. So you can accept it or reject it. Let's let's get into it. Mook Tananda's account of Kundalini awakening. Mook Tananda, who lived from 1908 to 1982, is the monastic name of the Siddha Yoga Guru, who was the founder of Siddha Yoga Spiritual Path. Mook Tananda was a disciple and successor of Bhagavan Nitya Nanda. He wrote a number of books on the subjects of Kundalini, Shakti, Vedanta, Kashmir, Shaivism, including a spiritual autobiography entitled The Play of Consciousness, Muktananda's Influence. During Muktananda's lifetime, he received accolades and praise from many different sources. His fame increased to the point that he was made the subject of a New York Magazine article hanging out with the guru, and a Time Magazine article, Instant Energy, both in 1976. Time quoted a follower of Muktananda, I don't think people come here looking for a religion. What they come for is an experience that will give meaning and substance to their lives. You don't have to believe or profess anything to be a follower of Baba. We don't become Hindus. People get whatever it is they get from Baba and their lives are changed. Okay? So, it's important to note that, you know, this guy, Muktananda, he um, received accolades and praise. He he was uh, the subject of a New York Magazine article, a Time Magazine article. I mean, he wasn't uh, some nobody. He definitely was influential. Let's continue. Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, who made transcendental meditation popular in the West in the 1960s, praised Muktananda, who, and he said, in him consciousness is in its own place. Not only does he flow within himself, but the world also flows with him. Consciousness constantly flows from him. In his autobiography, The Reverend Eugene Callender, Hold on a second before we uh, get to that. So, you, you see that uh, this Maharishi dude, he talked about Muktananda. So, I'm just trying to show you how important this Muktananda guy is. And that when he talks about his Kundalini experience, it is ta- his Kundalini awakening experience, it is coming from a position, from a place of one of the most influential Hindu gurus in history in modern times he is an authority on the subject now in his autobiography the Reverend Eugene Callender a Presbyterian minister in New York City describes meeting Muktananda for the first time at Carnegie Hall in 1979 this this statement that he makes is insane because this guy is supposed to be a Presbyterian preacher anyways here it is he said Muktananda said something that I had never heard in all my years in church all my years in Sunday school in seminary in ministry God dwells within you as you I sat there dumbfounded these words were very powerful before this I'd only heard that God was somewhere up in heaven God was up there, out there, somewhere, but not in here, not in my own heart. And now, here I was being told that God was in me too. I was astonished. For the first time in my life, I began to feel the presence and meaning of being created in the image of God and God's Holy Spirit dwelling in me. And I was filled with hope. This is so 
insane that this guy is a preacher who went to seminary, Presbyterian minister. I mean, give me a break. You, This guy sounds like such a liar. Like, you never heard someone say God dwells within you before and you went to seminary, you studied the Bible? You know, the Bible says, you know, Christ in you, the hope of glory. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And then what does it say? God was manifest in the flesh. Jesus Christ is God. God dwells within you. He, he said, what did he say? Uh, you know, God was up there, but not in my heart. Of course it is. They even have kids songs singing about it. I got the joy, joy, joy down in my heart. Where does it come from? Christ. People talk about Christ in their heart. I mean, give me a break. How could he have said, I never heard this in my life? Christ in you. God in you. God, God is Holy Spirit dwelling in you. I mean, that's what you're talking about. But this guy says that he felt all this because of this Muktananda guru. All right, so let's continue. Muktananda's background. Muktananda was born in 1908 near Mangalore at Karnataka State, India, into a well-off family. His birth name was Krishna Rao. At 15, he encountered Bhagavan Nityananda, a wandering avadhut who profoundly changed his life. After this encounter, Krishna left home and began his search for the experience of God. He studied under Siddharahudi Swami at Hubli where he learned Sanskrit, Vedanta and all branches of yoga and took the initiation of Sanyasa in the Sarasvati order of the Dashanami Sampradaya. Man, sorry guys, this is getting a little bit of a tongue twister for me here. <laughs> Taking the name of Swami Muktananda after Siddhartha Ruda's death, Muktananda began wandering India on foot, studying with many different saints and gurus. After more than 20 years of searching through the subcontinent of India, in 1947, Muktananda went to Ganeshpuri to receive the darshan of Bhagavan Nityananda, the renowned saint who originally inspired Muktananda to search for God. He received shock. Shaktipat initiation from him in the early morning of uh, August 15th of that year. Muktananda often said that his spiritual journey didn't truly begin until he received Shaktipat from the holy man. Well, I mean, come on. you Your life doesn't really begin until you receive the Shaktipat. Sorry, it's just... Uh, it's, it's just so crazy. You just... You gotta kind of make fun of it sometimes. And I mean, Shakti Pot. Listen to that. That's because I'm a. That's because I'm a dumb American. I know. I know. But anyways, Shakti Pot from the Holy Man Bhagavan Nityananda. According to his description, it was a profound and sublime experience. Okay, great. Now, well, not great, but <laughs> let's move on. Now, this is where it gets crazy. We're going to read a paragraph from Wikipedia to show how they whitewash what his account of this awakening, and then we're going to read the real account. Let's read Wikipedia's totally unbiased account of Muktananda's experience receiving the Shakti Pot. Now, that was, uh, you know, I'm just using sarcasm there, just joking around that it's totally unbiased because obviously they, it's so strange how they completely twisted this experience. But here it is from Wikipedia. They say, August 15th, 1947, Nityananda stood facing me directly. He looked into my eyes again, watching carefully. I saw a ray of light entering me from his pupils. It felt hot like burning fever. Its light was dazzling. It's like, like that of a high-powered bulb. As that ray emanating from Bhagavan Nityananda's pupils penetrated mine, I was thrilled with amazement, joy, and fear. 
I was beholding its color and chanting Guru Om. It was a full unbroken beam of divine radiance. Its color kept changing from molten gold to saffron to a shade deeper than the blue of a shining star. I stood utterly transfixed. He sat down and said in his aphoristic fashion, all mantras, one, each from Om, Om, whatever. I should think, I am Shiva, all this other stuff. Right. But anyways, that's the end. And, that, and that's all that happened. So, you know, you read that and you go, okay, whatever. Sounds kind of weird, but nothing too crazy. Doesn't sound, you know, dangerous. Doesn't sound that bad, right? Well, that wasn't the full story. So let's read about the full story. And I'm just going to read through this and just going to get through this, this account that he gives. And you will see, I hope, the danger of messing around with Kund- not only Kundalini and trying to awaken that serpent power coiled in the base of people's spine, as they try to say. Not only Kundalini, but any other type of concept of the force, the chi, ki, the prana, and all this stuff, you will hopefully see the danger of that. So let's read it. And I'll show you the source at the end so you can look it up yourself. Here we go. The massive ascetic Nityananda looked like an aging TV wrestler with almost inhumanly severe eyes. The moment of power transfer had come. It took place in Ganeshpur, a wilderness village in the fiery state of Maharashtra, not far from Bombay. It was the summer of 1947, when much of India still hung between the 20th century and the ancient past. His adept, Muktananda, was about to make a timeless journey, the journey of the power yogi, the Siddha, but it required the catalytic power of the master guru, Nityananda, or Guru Dev, who was God to Muktananda and therefore worthy of worship as the supreme deity. How blasphemous is that? Antichrist. Very bad. But anyways, this voyage of consciousness prized by the ancients, would split Muktananda into fragments, driving him to the limits of human consciousness. Unless superhumanly motivated, the normal person would give up at the first moment. So vast and haunting would be the terrors of the alien terrain. Perhaps the prize had something to do with this, creating the infinite desperation of the yogi, the momentum of will sufficient to pay any price to go the distance. By innuendo and teaching, he had been prepared for cosmic insanity, or perhaps even hell. Then the subtle transfer power came. Muktananda would describe the moment. Here we go. This is how Muktananda describes his experience. He says this, Guru Dev, his body close to mine, stood opposite. I opened my eyes and saw Guru Dev gazing directly at me, his eyes merging with mine in the Shambhavi Mudra, a classic posture. My body became numb. I could not shut my eyes. I no longer had the power to open or close them. I watched him very attentively. A ray of light was coming from his pupils and going right inside me. It was, its touch was searing, red hot and its brilliance dazzled my eyes like a high-powered bulb. As this ray flowed from Bhagavan Nityananda's eyes into my own, the very hair on my body rose in wonder, awe, ecstasy, and fear. I went on repeating his mantra while watching the colors of this ray. I stood there stunned, watching the brilliant rays passing into me. My body was completely motionless. Then the guru made one of his characteristic enigmatic sounds, a guttural sound, and bid then prostrate Muktananda to leave his presence. A few days later, the ma- that's not the end of it, so keep listening. A few days later, the master finished the sentence with another enigmatic, huh, a severe shake of the head and the order, go. This unleashing of energy began in Suki, a remote village in the same region. And because it gets it gets absolutely insane, the stuff that he says happens. The process of transformation was virtually immediate. Muktananda would hold on to his unquestioning faith 
in the guru-like rigging as a hurricane blew through his soul and insanity seemed a hair's breadth away. Muktananda was tapping into the power line. It was a revelation to his untutored mind. The setting was important, a wilderness of fields and nearby jungle, the village out of sight. He had a small kutir, a hut temple where he lived alone. The villagers revered and supported him. And with the social system of India, they would obey him implicitly and tolerate almost any behavior no matter how bizarre, for such were the signs of one who was touched with divinity. And with cosmic timing, the right divine personage would appear to guide him with the right subtle teaching needed to steer him through the predicament after another through one predicament after another. A holy oddity would come, full of pre-knowledge regarding the turmoil within Muktananda. It was all a vast play on a huge stage, and these gurus were characters who transcended, transcended the play, privy to all the scripts. True, a word of guidance at times came none too early. Consider. Now, listen to this. Here we go. I asked the old woman to leave and went inside my hut. I was assailed by all sorts of perverse and defiling emotions. My body started to move and went on like this in a confused sort of way. After a time, my breathing changed, became, becoming disturbed. Sometimes my abdomen would, sw would swell with air, after which I would ex exhale with great force. I became frightened. My thoughts became confused, meaningless. My limbs and body got hotter and hotter. My head felt heavy, and every pore in me began to ache. When I breathed out, my breath stopped in outside. When I breathed in, it stopped inside. This was terribly painful, and I lost my courage. Something told me that I would die at any moment. I could not understand what was happening. Who was making it happen? I felt drawn towards the mango trees. As I looked in that direction, I saw Guru Dev, a vision of Nityananda, sitting between them, his face toward me. Someone had seated himself in my eyes and was making me see things. Again, I looked at the mango trees. I could see Guru Dev Nityananda there, and he suddenly disappeared. It seemed that I was being controlled by some power which made me do all sorts of things. I no longer had a will of my own. My madness was growing all the time. My intellect was completely unstable. Think about that. We're not done yet, but think about that. That is insane that he says, it seemed I was being controlled by some power, which made me do all sorts of things. I no longer had a will of my own. That's not good. And you know, there's the thing. Whenever we talk about the force and energy and all this stuff, it's always from the perspective, and this is such, this is one of the biggest deceptions about this subject, okay? So pay attention. One of the biggest lies that you're told is that the force, the chi, the ki, the prana, the energy is there for you to control, to tap into it, tap into the force, tap into the energy, the chi. And it's for you to tap into and to use. For you to manipulate. For you to control. And the witches too. Oh, you witches, you can manipulate the energy. You can control. You're in control. Everyone's in control. Well, this extremely influential, very, very dedicated uh, Hindu guru said it seemed that I was being controlled by some power which made me do all sorts of things. I no longer had a will of my own. Doesn't sound like he's in control of the kundalini, of the prana, of the force, does it? Now it had control of him. Let's continue. Muktananda entered his hut later at night. Let's continue. He said, My fear increased every second. I heard hordes of people screaming frightfully, as if it were the end of the world. I looked and saw the sugar cane field on fire through the window. Then I saw strange creatures from six to fifty feet tall, neither demons nor demigods, but human in form, dancing naked, their mouths gaping open. 
Their screech was horrible and apocalyptic. I was completely conscious, but was watching my madness, which appeared to be real. Then I remembered death. Okay, and we're almost done. One more paragraph of that. Some pretty wild stuff. But he talks about seeing strange creatures, giants, 6 to 50 feet tall. Some other pretty crazy stuff. Then it says he sits in the yogic lotus posture. All around me I saw flames spreading. The whole universe was on fire. A burning ocean had burst open and swallowed up the whole earth. Sounds like a lake of fire. An army of ghosts and demons surrounded me. All the while I was locked into my lotus posture. My eyes closed. My chin pressed down against my throat so that no air could escape. Then I felt searing pain in the knot of in the knot of nerves in the lower chakra power center at the base of the spine. Okay, now remember this is all from a new a kundalini awakening, right? An army of ghosts and demons surrounded him. Felt the searing pain in the northern earth, the lower chakra, at the base of the spine. I felt a pain, searing pain. My eyes opened. I wanted to run away, but my legs were locked in the lotus posture. Now I saw the whole earth covered with waters from universal destruction. The world had been destroyed, and I alone was left. Only my hut had been saved. Then from over the water was a moon-like sphere about four feet in diameter. Excuse me. That came floating in it stopped in front of me this radiant white ball struck against my eyes and then passed inside me it came from the sky and entered me the light penetrated all through me my tongue curled up against my palate and my eyes closed i saw a dazzling light in my forehead and i was terrified i was still locked up and locked in the loaded position then my head was forced down and glued to the ground the night went on as others, other processes continued. By daybreak, a new phenomenon had taken hold. I started to make a sound like a camel, which, sorry, I started to make a sound like a camel. Oh my goodness, this is insane. I started to make a sound like a camel, which alternated with the roaring of a tiger. I must have roared very loudly, for the people actually thought that a tiger had got into the sugarcane field. The impulse of this cryo energy possession lasted only a brief while. Now, what does that sound like, too? Making animal sounds. I have seen this happen in the charismatic churches. People walking around barking like dogs. Other sounds. The next night, his red blood cells spun like discs and glowed a deep red, coursing through his body. Muktananda says, said often in referring to this period, I understood nothing about the various experiences, such as the vision of dissolution and the radiant light that had come to me on the first day. Only afterwards did I learn that they were all part of a process pertaining to Shaktipat, the divine power touch of the Guru. Shaktipat is simply another name for the full grace of the supreme guru. This was the awakening process of the kundalini. The serpent-like energy the yogis believed believe is curled at the base of the spine and its rising upward can only be handled by a well-initiated adept driving most people irretrievably mad should they even get the mildest taste of it these are the quotes these are quotes from muktananda himself taken from his autobiography titled play of consciousness a spiritual autobiography by swami muktananda and then there's added commentary as found in another book you can get called writers of the cosmic circuit the dark side of super consciousness by tal brook uh, that's definitely good source to expose that type of stuff but anyways this what did he say this was the awakening process of the kundalini now it doesn't sound as fun as it's often portrayed does it 
And it didn't sound like what they were talking about on Wikipedia about um, Muktananda's experience, did it? They whitewashed it. But beyond him, you know, this is the reality of it. And the, the bottom line is, is when you're messing around with the Kundalini, with this force, with the prana, the chi, all the stuff, you're messing around with things that you don't understand. You think you do. You think you're in control. You think that you know what you're doing and you understand it. But the reality is, is you really don't. You might have, and it doesn't matter. You can, you, all, I, uh, you studied this, you read a bunch of books about it. You talk to gurus, you've studied your own, you've had experiences. You're like, oh no, it's fine. Well, it's not fine. You just think it is. And just because you haven't had an experience like that doesn't mean anything. You know, the point is, is that he was getting to, he wanted this, he really sought after this kundalini awakening, this experience. And this is what can happen from, it's all from the same force. This is what you need to understand. The kundalini, the prana, the chi, the ki, all that stuff. It's all the same thing. And this is where, you know, this is the type of thing that can happen from this. Not good. Not something good. And we're not even... We haven't even explained what this is, by the way. All I'm showing right now is that it's not all sunshines and rainbows and, and it's always positive, like they say. It sounds pretty negative right here. Pretty crazy and insane. He says, basically, they said you're dancing on the edge of going insane. And so we're just proving that. But then, you know, you have to ask the question, well, what in the world is this? Is this energy or is it what is it? And is there, like they say in, in Star Wars, is there a dark side and a, and a light side? And why is it, why did that happen? And what is it? Well, we're going to get into that. We're going to see that. We're just going to move on to this, this uh, section real quick. Bubba Free John. Adi Da Samraj, born Franklin Albert Jones, 1939 to 2008 he lived, was an American spiritual teacher, writer, and artist. He was the founder of a new religious movement known as Adi Dam. He changed his name numerous times throughout his life. These include Bubba Free John, Da Free John, Da Love, Ananda, all kinds of names. Okay, who cares? And Adi Da initially became known in the spiritual counterculture of the 1970s for his books and public talks and for the activities of his religious community. His philosophy was essentially similar to many Eastern religions which see spiritual enlightenment as the ultimate priority of human life, distinguishing his from other religious traditions. Adi Da declared that he was a uniquely historic avatar incarnation of a god or divinity human form as such Adi Da stated that henceforth devotional worship of him would be the sole means of spiritual enlightenment for anyone else yeah of course that's what they this is what the cult leaders say devotional worship of them that's how you get the enlightenment you got to worship them same thing the devil said give him the worship instead of god one of the dangers of kundalini energy is temporary or permanent insanity. <laughs> uh, I'm sensing a theme here. This insanity. Temporary or permanent insanity. Here are a few illustrations from meditators who follow Guru Bubba Free John. Here's what they say, talking about some uh, kundalini energy. And uh, you see what you think about that about this kundalini experience. Bubba's eyes rolled up and his lips pulled into a sneer. His hands formed mudras as he slumped against Sal, who also fell back against other devotees sitting behind him. Almost immediately, many of those present began to feel the effects of intensified Shakti power. All through the... Um, spontaneous internal movement of the life force. Their bodies jerked or shook, their faces contorted, some began to cry, scream, and moan. The whole bathhouse seemed to have slipped into another world. Again, this sounds exactly like 
the people, if you've ever seen these these revivals in these charismatic churches, like with that guy Rodney Howard Brown, Todd Bentley, Benny Hinn, all this stuff, um, Kenneth Hagen, exact same thing happens. People are shaking. What did they say here? They fell a, fell back against other devotees. They're always falling backwards, by the way. But they fall backwards onto other people, and then those other people start getting affected by this energy. And it's all it's like contagious, and they're all touching each other. Same thing. I saw Bubba just enter into Sal, just go right into Sal. From there, he went all over to everybody else. And then everybody else started going crazy. My hands were slowing and vibrating. It felt like electricity, like they were on radar or something. And they were just being directed to all the people around me. I felt like I was conducting the force. Notice how they use that. The force threw me to the others there people were screaming and howling crying and yelling out as soon as i went into the room i felt the force my head started jerking and i sat down next to billy um, sickness and joe hamp the force went through and through my body at first warm then hot it started to hurt i was in a sitting position my hand was raised and i couldn't move it because the force moving through it my head was bent down. I was so full of intensity, I started to cry. I was so insane, I didn't know what was happening at all. Everybody sitting here stared, started to have incredible Shakti manifestations and other things. It was absolutely intense. When I was sitting here with everybody, I was shaking and it felt sort of like I was possessed. The terror of being destroyed totally destroyed what did they say and it felt sort of like i was possessed suddenly his body exploded with movements his arms and legs flying outward his head rolling around and snapping force seemed to be flung from his body into others present from and this is taken from the free john's garbage and the goddess And then one more comment here from uh, this book, Tal Brooks, Riders of the Cosmic Circuit. What is called intensification or possession by energy is a core experience in the historical literature of meditation and many occult practices. This energizing is experiences um, as a dramatic and even overwhelming influx of spiritual power. It can be wild or uncontrollable, even deadly and irrespective of the interpretation placed on it, it shares characteristics with spirit possession. Abundant literature illustrates this, such as Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh's The Book of the Secrets, Swami Muktananda's Play of Consciousness, Swami Rudrananda's Spiritual Cannibalism, Da Free John's Garbage and the Goddess, Talbrook's Writers of the Cosmic Circuit. Okay, so... That's very interesting because we're tying together to the next subject that we're going to talk about here. But this last paragraph, you read about this, uh, you know, this Kundalini awakening from the, the Bubba John dude. And it sounded really messed up. And people were talking about feeling like they're going insane. Pretty insane. So, but here uh, is an important that we want to talk about here is that it shares a characteristic with spirit possession. Now, this person even said, I was shaking, and it felt sort of like I was possessed. Okay? And that's what we're trying to talk about here. Is that all these kundalini experiences match the characteristics of being possessed by demons. Or, uh, devils unclean spirits evil spirits that's this is exactly what they show the characteristics of over and over and over again all of the characteristics of it and yet what is craziest 
It's all under the deceptive cover of being some sort of force or energy. Right? So think about this. Uh, people are so trusting, right? And they think that they're, they're so proud that they don't think that they could be deceived. Well, think about this. Imagine that, you know, there is, the, the, just think for a second, there is a world of, an invisible world of spirits, good, good and evil. And just focusing on the evil spirits for a second, there's this, there's these evil spirits living in this invisible realm and they want to deceive people. They want to hurt, they want to hurt people. But in order to more effectively hurt people, they deceive them. And part of the deception is making people not even believe that they exist. And using other names that are more palatable, that are more friendly, to deceive people into uh, accepting them and their presence. Okay? And, and what I'm saying is evil spirits using the cover of the names chi ki prana kundalini all this energy the force the energy that they're tapping into is actually spirits that's it that's all it is and so there isn't some invisible force out there some neutral force or whatever that you can control and manipulate. I know it sounds like some something that you would want to believe, but it's simply not true. It's a uh, it's a deception. Now I'm not, uh, now if you read here's the thing you read all these experiences. I don't think these people are making it up making up what happened. These are very detailed and intense accounts of things that they experienced. I don't think they're all making it up. And so we know, you know, that they're describing these experiences. But it's the perception of what was happening that's the dispute, right? Something crazy and intense happened. They're saying, well, it's just this energy. But all the while, they're saying, well, I felt like I was possessed. And then in, in Muktananda's experience, he's like, well, I felt like I didn't have a will of my own. I was being controlled. Possessed. That's, that's what it means. Think about the word possess. To possess. To control. Like a spirit controlling their bodies. And remember what I was saying earlier. They all, you know, all kinds of people, whether they're in you know, into the, the chi and all this stuff. They think they can control it. Control the energy. Manipulate the energy. The witches think, oh, I can manipulate the energy. They don't think it's going to control them. But it will. It can. Okay? So, and then uh, I didn't put really a whole section on this, but there's also orgone energy, animal magnetism. You know, we go on and on about that type of stuff. That ties in together with this too. It's all the same type of concept of, uh, you know, the chi, the ki, the prana, the force. Okay. So let's move on to the next section because that shows it shows a couple experiences that from people that were very dedicated and involved in this. They had contact with gurus. They had a kundalini awakenings. And it was very negative. Uh, insane, intense almost to the point of insanity and even painful, crazy. And then also there's a lot of parallels between that spirit possession and also with charismatic Pentecostal experiences and all these fake revivals that happen. And exactly, Todd Bentley kicking, you know, he, he's all kinds of crazy shaking and stuff like this. And then, you know, he supposedly, oh, he falls into sin and he gets taken down out of ministry. But then he's being restored by Rick Joyner, who is openly a Knight of Malta wearing this Knight of Malta cape. So, explain that one. 
All right, let's continue. Occultist explains how chi slash prana slash the force is magic. Okay, so now I'm going to show you how this ties together with witchcraft. If you think witchcraft doesn't exist, great, good for you. Um, you don't know what you're talking about. So go back to burying your head in the sand because this is the real world where people, there are witches. They do witchcraft. They're involved in magic and it, they take it very seriously. And they don't do it for no reason because nothing happens. Right? So this isn't from independentfundamentalbaptist.com. This is from isisbooks.com. <laughs> okay? And taken from an article from Isis Books, a cult bookstore, look at what they say. Hey, listen, to the, look at the title. Chi, George, Lucas, and Magic. Yeah. We'll see what they say. Is Tai Chi magic, she asked. That depends on your definition of magic, was my answer. And as Eastern energy work becomes more prominent in the West, the frequency of this question increases. Not only is Tai Chi questioned, the curiosity extends to, among other things, Feng Shui, Reiki, Qigong, and martial arts. Uh, I actually used to have a martial arts videotape. When I was younger, a teenager, I did uh, Kung Fu. Uh, I did a style called Pai Lum, White Dragon Chinese Boxing. And uh, it was kind of a weird, obscure type of kung fu. But anyways, um, my teacher gave me uh, these this videotape. It was very strange. It was like this qigong, qigong thing. And they do these very crazy stunts where they train a, a lot to do this. But, you know, they say it, it, they have to u build up the energy in order to do these things. And they, like, lay down in broken glass... They take spears, like a two, um, a double-edged, like one each side of the stick is a spear, and they both put it in their necks, uh, in the clavicle, basically, and they push it together, and they move closer to each other until the, the, when the spear is bending until it breaks in the middle, and they're pushing the pointy end of their necks. Some of them are laying down on swords and spinning around, one guy was like, he laid on the bottom in broken glass, and then they put like a, a granite slab on him, and then they a guy laid on top of that, and they put a slab on him, and then they laid a guy on top of that, then they put a slab on him, <laughs> and then they laid one on the top, and then after all that's done, and the guy's still in the bottom with his back in broken glass, some other guy comes up with a sledgehammer and starts smashing the stone on these guys one by one, and they all get off until the guy in the bottom gets up and... He like brushes up the glass and they're like, oh, look, you didn't get hurt. And uh, just the craziest stuff. But they, you know, they would train for years to become these Qigong masters. And it, they attributed their power to not get hurt to this energy and stuff. So it's tied together with the martial arts. But anyways, Feng Shui, Reiki, Qigong, martial arts. The linking theme in these systems is Qi. In Korean key in Japanese as it shall remain for the rest of this article key the concept of key originated in ancient China it was expounded upon by thinkers such as Lao Tzu who saw it as the source of creativity expressed in the form of yin feminine and yang masculine and Quan Tzu who considered key to be divine the divine force that penetrates all things every person has key as does the universe as a whole as each person is composed of atoms and molecules or as is the universe, so our personal key finds resonance and likeness in the universal key. It's, you know, just think about that in light of everything that we've seen. It's a bunch of garbage. But look at what they say. In pagan terms, as above, so below. Okay, so that's an occultic term, as above, so below, comes from alchemy. And this witch is talking about that when they're talking about the key. And they say, or in more modern terms, the force is omnipresent. Okay? So this witch says, uh, as above, so below, is the same thing as saying the force is omnipresent. Like when people say the force is with you, like from Star Wars. The force is omnipresent and envelopes you as it radiates from you. It is a nothingness that can accomplish miracles. As Obi-Wan told Luke in Star Wars, Eastern 
energy works influence the flow of key within the individual the individual's environment by extension the universe this is done in many different ways tai chi is a martial art whose emphasis has changed from external defense against attackers to internal defense against stress and illness in tai chi a Ch of chinese origin or tao Qi, the Japanese version, a system of slow rhythmic movements, channels key through the body, removing blockages that cause physical illness and releasing the physical stress accumulated through the mental and emotional stress of daily life. This is what they're saying. Again, so again, it's always presented as something good. You ever notice that? Always. They say, oh, it's for healing and removing blockages and blah, blah, blah. They said the same thing about chakras. Oh, you know, energy gets blocked and you got to unblock the flow. Well, I think I want to block a lot of stuff. I don't want to unblock anything because what happens when you unblock is people start vibrating and shaking and screaming and seeing 60-foot giants. I think I'm all set with that. I mean, stop. Oh, Always say, oh, it's for healing. It's all good. No, it's not. The physical the beginner is taught to move key by means of control breathe again they always do the breathing 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 the conscious attention to the energy flow within the body with practice this becomes natural and any blockages can be felt and removed the slow repetitive movement is a form of meditation in motion that's okay so meditation in motion that's like what tai chi is as with any exercise measurable health benefits yeah whatever Feng Shui is a form of environmental energy manipulation which originated in China. Used there for centuries, it is gaining popularity in the West, generating volumes of literature and many accessories. Yeah, it's a bunch of trash, okay? You, arranging your furniture a certain way in your house because of the energy is you're just feeding into this chi key garbage. Okay, it doesn't matter how, you know, arrange your furniture in your house... The way that makes most sense, not because of how the energy flows. That's not something that you should be doing. Uh, the basis for this art is as the redirection of key through the home or office through the beneficial results. Homes and businesses in China are analyzed before construction for optimum placement on the building site. And if such is not possible, tools be including bagua mirrors and crystal balls on red strings are used to remedy the situation each area of the structure is held to have its own identity and the key flowing there cannot be allowed to diminish for example washing away in flowing water as in the bath or having its flow broken by such things as exposed ceiling beams perpendicular to the stream it's, it's just a bunch of superstition nonsense rules that they're coming up with Disruption of the optimal flow can have results ranging from bad, such as minor business problems, to catastrophic. Ooh, and they try to scare you. If you don't do the feng shui and hang red crystal balls and put your chair on the left side and the table on the right, then you will have devastating consequences. It's just to keep you in bondage to this garbage. That's all it is. Um, it is rumored that Bruce Lee, oh, Bruce Lee, a martial artist and actor, died because he failed to replace a broken Bagua mirror in the front of his house. Oh, bunch of garbage. Stop it. Of course, some witch says this. That's not what happened. Anyways, let's continue. Reiki. People might say, oh, Reiki. That's, what's wrong with that? Well, think about it. Uh, someone floats their hands around your body and they claim to have healing energy and they're going to heal your body with healing energy emanating out of their hands that's all nothing less than the chi ki prana force all this stuff reiki is most commonly translated from the original japanese to mean universal life force there it is again universal life force the force it is a method of energy healing that uses a specific part of the key that flows around and through all beings. Reiki can be transmitted locally by a technique that resembles laying on of hands. Hmm. Sounds again like Pentecostal charismatic movement. Or it can be sent 
over infinite distances to heal a patient far away. Oh, infinite. All right. The student does not learn this art, but is attuned to it by a teacher known as a Reiki master. The title master does not connotate superiority in anything but training and experience. Well, Jesus said, call no man on earth master, so I don't think I'm going to call anyone master except Jesus Christ. The Reiki practitioner's power does not come from within, but from without. From the life force energy present throughout the existence, uh, the universal key, the Usui system Reiki, named after Macau, Dr. Macau Usui, who rediscovered Reiki near the turn of the century. There are three levels of training, Reiki 1, Reiki 2, all right. Who cares? Bunch of Reiki stuff. Let's continue. You know. Well, well actually, one last thing. Uh, there is no particular arcane ritual involved in any of the healing or attunements or in secrets are kept from respect for the art, not as a means of excluding those. Okay, so anyone can learn whatever. It's happened to the energy. Qi Kong is a discipline similar to Tai Chi. In theory, it originated as a form of key manipulation for health purposes whereas Tai Chi began as a form of external self-defense. We already know that. Okay. The other martial arts, which make extensive use of the key energy, uh, Shaolin temples in China, from which most modern martial arts were developed, present in the oldest true Shaolin Kung Fu, and one of the newest, Ed Parker's American Kenpo Karate. By the way, I don't do Kung Fu anymore. When I was talking about I did Kung Fu when I was a teenager. I didn't do it for that long. And also, it was interesting when um, they had a weird ranking system. It wasn't like karate. Like, you weren't allowed to get your black belt if you were under 18. They thought that was kind of silly to give little kids black belts. An adult could just, like, punch them in the face and they're dead. But anyways, uh, you, <laughs> you start off with a red sash. Uh, and I got that. It was, like, a bunch of older dudes... And I was like the youngest one, but I got the red sash and they did this ceremony at uh, some restaurant and they gave me this ring and it was a, it was a dragon coiled around your finger. And um, actually what happened was they said that you, depending on the level that you go up to move the ring on different fingers. Well, I was all excited and then I had the thing at home and I thought that I lost it. Turns out I think my mom threw it in the trash because she didn't like it. So, <laughs> which is a good thing. But I was mad at the time. Anyways, in the present in the oldest true Shaolin Kung Fu, one of the newest Ed Parker's American Kenpo Karate, developed in the United States in the 50s. Dramatic video footage exists of its use by Aikido founder. Yeah, there's a lot of. Uh, man, the Aikido stuff. Founder Murray Ushiba attacked by several military policemen in a training exercise. Ushiba Osensei appears on tape to disappear and reappear outside the converging attack. Well, I don't know. We'll have to see about that. Few practitioners attain this level of key control, but all can learn some. You know, the, you know, I believe like there is some stuff that goes on like that. I really do. I just. It never gets videotaped. They don't. They don't allow anyone to see this stuff. That's why they do all these Shaolin monks and stuff. They hide away everywhere, and they're like, "No, you can't. You're not supposed to let anyone see that you can do this stuff." Anyways, like the Jedi training of Luke Skywalker and the Star Wars series, key training involves becoming aware of and in contact with the power that infuses all existence and learning to work with that power. Just like Jedi's, Lou George Lucas, creator of Skywalker's Cosmos, was a student of mythologist Joseph Campbell. Go back and watch my video, Star Wars, One World Religion, Antichrist, because I talk about Joseph Campbell in there extensively. And he was a student of Joseph Campbell. And also, uh, anyways, continue. His young adventurer follows the traditional mythic hero's path, as do all seekers to a great or lesser degree. Um, um, yeah, and so the movie Star Wars follows that um, hero's journey that Joseph Campbell talks about. And it's another thing that also Jordan Peterson talks about, interestingly enough. If we follow the path that is tradition in the West, 
we attain to oneness with the Holy Spirit. No, 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 no. Don't be talking about the Holy Spirit. I don't even want to read that. It makes me sick. Anyways. Um, this witch is talking about that. This is so insane. Anyways, let's continue. Uh, I'm just going to skip past on this, honestly. We get it. The point is, is this witch is talking about, you know, you can read the rest of that you want. But, you know, they're talking about how, um, same thing. That this chi and stuff is the same force as they're talking about in Star Wars. Let's look at this last paragraph, though. If by... Hold on a second. Of course, there's something right there. Yeah, they're trying to connect the energy stuff with quantum physics and stuff. It has nothing to do with that when you read about these experiences. Yeah, it's absolute garbage. If by magic one means the ability to influence the body and psyche in measurable ways, but without outwardly visible, scientifically measurable means, then yes, Tai Chi is magic. If one takes the anthropology logical point of view that magic is an attempt to control outside phenomena by personal actions the answer is again yes as key is used to heal and provide a positive work and living environment traditional pagans may not agree with this but until we can measure key with their scientific instruments it is like the energy they influence with their rituals indistinguishable from magic okay, just a bunch of uh, hogwash no, it's uh, it's just uh, you know there's always this these slippery statements where you can never nail it down and they don't want to just come out and say exactly what they believe, but um, but they said the energy they influence with their rituals indistinguishable from magic, and there there you know there is an admission here about that that it's it's the same thing that they're you know. Um, and again, uh, uh, there, you, you, you talk to certain, I, I asked someone, I was witnessing one time, I was, uh, on the street, witnessing to someone, they said they're a witch, and I said, would you define, you know, how do you define it, this magic and stuff like that? And I said, manipulation of energy. He said, yes, manipulation of energy. And, I'm just thinking like, okay, so you just think you're dealing with energy and it's not. So this is this is a theme that happens over and over and over again. Oh, it's energy. It's a force. It's this. It's that. It's the other thing. Anything but spirits, evil spirits. Now, sometimes people do deal with spirits, of course, uh, they think it's spirits of the dead or even sometimes angels or even people think they deal with evil spirits. But they think, if, you know, they sprinkle, a, they draw a triangle on the ground and they, they're in a protective circle that they'll be fine. Well, they're just a bunch of baloney. They're not protected at all from that. So anyways, it's another, that's kind of going beyond the scope of this. But let's continue. To sum it all up. Let's sum this up. A kundalini release, which is energy that lies dormant at the base of the spine until it is activated as by the practice of yoga and channeled upward through the chakras in the process of spiritual perfection, is often the result of such practices. This can be triggered by the aforementioned meditation, yoga, breathing exercises, reiki, qigong, healing, tantra, transcendental meditation, and other Eastern or New Age spiritual exercises. When the kundalini energy is rising through the chakras, meridians, it can cause big problems for the body and mental health of the practitioner. Thousands of people around the world who have been damaged by these artificial spiritual exercises, which are simply wholly demonic slash yeah, demonic in origin and ostensibly consist of various techniques or intentional triggers of transformative experience such as sensory isolation and sensory overload 
Oh, man, yeah, we get into these practices. Yeah, sensory deprivation tanks, biofeedback, meditation of every description, Zen, Tibetan Buddhist, chaotic, transcendental, Christian Kabbalist, Kundalini, Raja, Raja Yoga, Tantric Yoga, Psychosynthesis, a system that combines imagery and meditative state, chanting, mood-altering music, mind-expanding drugs, esoteric systems of religious mysticism and knowledge, guided imagery, balancing and aligning energies, hypnosis, body disciplines, radical seminars designed to obliterate former values, etc. And why do we just list all those things? Because... What do we read? The people have been damaged by uh, various techniques that you know all ta- they say that they're talking about this energy, and it's and you know it's and so you got to think of it like this: it's all getting to the same thing, right? But it's through different religions, religious practices, different various types of of things that people engage in, and it's they say that they're all talking about this force. So it doesn't matter how you get there or what you call it. You're going to the same place in the end. And at the end of the day, when you're you start talking about some invisible life force, you're messing with something that you don't understand and it's not good and it's always going to present be presented as good as something positive. You know, evil is not going to present itself as evil to you, to most people. Because it will be rejected. If it's just openly evil. Okay. So, we're going to end this video with the... This last section. Um, And what this is going to show is that... What I'm going to do is I'm going to show... um, the abilities that they portray in Star Wars movies, that the abilities that people have, that Jedi's have from uh, the Force, and how it exactly describes uh, abilities that people talk about and having in witchcraft, that witches and occultists have, and people that are possessed by demons. It's the exact same thing, description of people that use the Force. Is just it's basically like they're just witches okay so Jedi's are nothing but witches running around doing magic and that's it and that's and this is exact description of everything that they can do is exact description of what witches talk about occultists okay so it's not even like hard to prove but we're just gonna go through this pretty quick force abilities the force in Star Wars can enhance natural, physical, and mental abilities, including strength, such as during a force jump or a slow, or to slow a fall from an otherwise dangerous height, and accuracy, as when Luke Skywalker was able to launch proton torpedoes into a two-meter-wide thermal exhaust port on the Death Star in A New Hope. I feel like such a nerd saying that. Proton torpedoes into a two meter wide thermal exhaust port on the Death Star. Whatever. It's in the notes. Alright, let's continue. So, enhanced strength, right? Because the force jump, it, they had, they say they have enhanced strength. Well, someone had enhanced strength in the Bible. Let's read about them. Mark chapter 5, verse 1. And they came over Onto the other side of the sea in the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, was he in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him, and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. 
Okay, so this was a man who was possessed by devils, unclean spirits, and he had so many in them that the thing said, my name is Legion, for we are many. Many, many, many devils went into him. And what happened? He had supernatural strength. It says that no man could bind him. They couldn't bind him with chains and fetters. He broke them. No one could tame him. Did he get his... He get, sounds like he got his power from the force. And the force is a legion of devils. Next point. A number of other force powers are demonstrated in the film series, including telekinesis. Telekinesis. A.K.A. Psychokinesis. Telekinesis is the ability to move an object on the physical plane using only psychic power, using your mind. This comes from the Chi Energy. From the website howtotelekinesis.com, last but not least, we must have sufficient energy to perform telekinesis. In fact, doing some homemade Qigong exercise is how I first discovered my telekinetic abilities. After seven months of daily Qi work, I started feeling an abundance of energy flowing in and around my body. It felt sort of like an electromagnetic force field surrounding me, which is not evil. It's not a force field. It just, it's just so crazy because it's like, it's like uh, adults that this is something that like kids would fantasize about and then they, they just become adults and they never let this go and they're trying to pursue this type of stuff. It's like I have a forest field surrounding me. No, you don't. You have devils. That's what this is. And it's not, and you know, it's not just some stu- you see, it's not some stupid thing where it's I'm some ignorant Christian and I just blame everything on the devil. No, I document it so extensively. It's not even funny. Plus, the, you know, we could there's a a bunch of other things that we could do, other shows and studies proving this type of stuff. But everybody says, oh, it's a force. It's it's energy. That's what's moving the object. It's by moving them with my mind. No. You're not. Devils move the objects, not the mind. They'll let you think it's you're doing it, though. Telepathy. Telepathy is the purported transmission of information from one person to another without using any of our known sensory channels or physical interaction. Okay, so supposedly, you know, this is like the transmitting of information through your mind, reading people's minds, all that stuff, right? Comes from prana. If you go to the path from the Path Beyond Sorrow, a collection of lectures by Swami Chadananda, close disciple of Swami Sivananda. He said the three occult phenomena of telepathy, clairvoyance, and clairaudience are all upon the lowest level when one's prana becomes refined and one's mind becomes purified, these phenomena come naturally and one is not aware of them. Some even though... All right, let's skip down. These three powers are the primary powers in yoga. The primary occult phenomena in the path of yoga. And they come much more rapidly in yoga than in other methods. Wow. Much more rapidly using yoga. You know, uh, Alistair Crowley wrote a book on yoga, too. I wonder why. Uh, but anyways, you know, so that, you know, telepathy is another thing that they can do with the Force in Star Wars. And this is something they do in the cultic practices and mysticism. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Levitation. Levitation or transvection is the paranormal. In the paranormal context is the rising of a human body into the air by mystical means. Some parapsychology and religious believers interpret alleged instances of levitation as a result of supernatural action of psychic power or spiritual energy. Uh, well, how about this? Through the power of witchcraft and devils. Um, levitation, right? We have one from an uh, account of Simon Magus from history who you know, was in the Bible and he tried to pay Peter money for the power, the gift of the Holy Ghost. He's like, oh, can I have this power? And he tried to offer him money and Peter rebuked him and said, thy money perish with thee. You can't buy, you can't buy the power of the Holy Ghost. 
And so, if you read a lot of commentaries uh, on the Bible and like the Book of Acts and stuff, and like this history, it they all say that Simon the sorcerer, after that, became this like super well known sorcerer. So. Here's one account of it from Pliny the Elder's A Natural History. During the contest before Nero in the Roman amphitheater, Simon Magus levitated above the city. Simon Magus was a reputed sorcerer said to have bewitched the people of Samaria and led to believe that he was possessed of divine power. They claimed that he could make himself invisible when he pleased to be able to levitate at will and assume the appearance of another person, pass through fire unharmed, cause statues to come alive, make furniture move without any visible means of imparting motion. He claimed to be God. An account described to St. Clement states that on the arrival of Peter, Simon flew gracefully through a window into the outside air. This is what they said was going on. So, anyways, he was said to levitate, all this other stuff, and then the you know telekinetic powers. How was it from a uh, witchcraft? And it says there's Simon the sorcerer. And we're going to read a little bit about that right here. Acts chapter eight, verse nine. It says, "But there was a certain man called Simon. This is the guy, Simon Magus, who was before time in the same city, used sorcery." And bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard, because of a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. Okay, so, talks about him being a, a sorcerer in the Bible, and then history says he was levitating and doing all this stuff. It's by the power of witchcraft. Same thing as what Jedi's do the same things that sorcerers do. That's what Jedis do. Levitation in Hinduism. In Hinduism, it is believed that some Hindu gurus who have become siddhas, uh, those who have achieved spiritual powers, have the power of being able to levitate. You know, you've seen that before in maybe a, a movie, cartoon, or whatever. They have people sitting in a lotus position and they're floating in the air, levitating. Uh, but anyways, you know, that's in there. They account for that. Levitation is said to be possible mastering Hindu philosophy. Okay, yeah, look at this. Levitation is said to be possible by mastering the Hindu philosophy of yoga. Yogi Subhaya Pulyavar was reported to have levitated into the air for four minutes in front of a crowd of 150 witnesses in June 6, 1936. He was seen suspended horizontally several feet above the ground in a trance, lightly resting his hand upon the top of a cloth-covered stick. Pulover's arms and legs could not be bent from their locked positions once on the ground. So, it's what people said. Uh, but mastering yoga. Alright, deep hypnosis. Uh, hypnosis is a state of mind. Hold on. Um... Yeah... Well, this is pretty interesting. We can talk about that real quick. You know, actually, no, yeah, yeah, because that was in in Star Wars. He was like, uh, you know, telling that people, like, saying they tell people certain things, like, oh no, that didn't really happen, and they're like, yeah, that didn't happen. So they're like hypnotizing them. Yeah, so the Jedi's do that. Hypnosis is a state of human consciousness involving focused attention and reduced peripheral awareness and an enhanced capacity for response to suggestion. During hypnosis, a person is said to have heightened focus and concentration. The person can concentrate intensely on a specific thought or memory while blocking out sources of distraction. Hypnotized subjects are said to show an increased response to suggestion. Hypnosis is usually induced by a procedure known as hypnotic induction. Involving... A series of preliminary instructions and suggestions. Modern hypnotism... Owes its name and appearance to in the realm of science investigations made by James Braid. Here's a quote from James Braid as to where hypnotism came from. All right. We'll read this quote. In as much in as much as patients can throw themselves into the nervous sleep and manifest all the usual phenomena of mesmerism through 
their own unaided efforts as I have so repeatedly proved by causing them to maintain a steady fixed gaze at any point, concentrating their whole mental energies on the idea of an object looked at, or that the same may arise by the patient looking at the point of his own finger, or as the Magi of Persia and Yogi of India have practiced for the last 2400 years. For religious purposes, throwing themselves into their ecstatic trances by main, each maintaining a steady fixed gaze at the tip of his own nose, it is obvious that there is no need for an exoteric influence to produce the phenomena of mesmerism. And that is from The Power of the Mind Over the Body by James Braid. Um, so he was saying that, you know, the Hindus, the, those practice Hinduism, they were, they've been doing it for over 2,000 years. So it's not new. But anyways, it's part of their practice. Uh, famous historian Will Durant writes in his book, The Story of Civilizations, hypnotism as therapy seems to have originated among Indians who often took their sick to the... And by the way, I'm not picking on Indian people, um, just so we we're clear on that. We're talking about Hindu practices and stuff like that. Um, just wanted to make sure that we understand that. Um, hypnotism as therapy seems to have originated among Indians who often took their sick to the temples to be cured by hypnotic suggestion. The Englishmen who introduced hypnotherapy into England, Braid, Esdale, and Elliotson, undoubtedly got their ideas and some of their experience from contact with India. And that's what happened. Uh, Oriental hypnosis is an old Indian method of healing practiced by sadhus, fakirs, yogis, Sanayasis, these people indulge in self-induced hypnosis or trance states by practicing rhythmic breathing exercise method like pranayama meditation. For heterohypnosis, they used threatening stare and suggestive techniques like loud commands uh, to bring out the subject's imagination generated from within the mind. All right. But anyways, point is, you got hypnotism. And this type of thing that they do with the force, but this comes from these Hindu practices originally. Um, I'm going to kind of skip past this a little bit. Enhanced empathy. Uh, you know, it kind of might sound like a weird thing, but it's actually part of witchcraft. Uh, from a witchcraft website, psi.wikia.com. And they say. In the occult, empathy is the ability to sense, feel, and understand the emotions, feelings, hopes, dreams, desires, and fears of others, and eventually manipulate emotions. So they admit that they're manipulating emotions. It's just gross, man. But anyways, an empath has the capacity to recognize emotions that are being experienced in another being. And by the way, empathy is different than sympathy. You notice that? I want you to make sure you understand that. Empathy is... The ability to sense other people's emotions and feelings. It doesn't mean you feel bad for them. Sympathy is you feel bad for someone, right? You, you empathize, but then you sympathize what they're going through. You kind of put yourself in their shoes. Empathy is a tool used by manipulators. Now they call it uh, emotional intelligence. The ability to read other people's emotions and just using that to control people, manipulate them. So pay attention to that. Uh, empathy has to do with emotions, where telepathy has to do with thoughts. Blah, blah, blah. Power to recognize, perceive, feel the emotions of others. True empathy can also influence the feelings of others around them. Many empaths strengthen their power by, many empaths strengthen their power by meditating. And using it regularly. Basic empathy. The user can feel other people's emotions. Eventually determine where it's coming from. Why the person's feeling that way. Blah, blah, blah. I'm going to skip past that. You know, you read that later if you want. Um, sensing another blah, blah, blah. 
so disturbance in the force so though this is from uh, Star Wars those who possess the discipline and a subtlety of mind to sense the force often refer to disturbances in the force since the force is an energy field created by all living things a disturbance can be felt when there is death or suffering on a massive scale a disturbance or tremor may also be felt in the presence of a powerful Jedi or Sith okay so this disturbance of the force what I'm showing you is that this is talking about like um, what they talk about as an empath in witchcraft this empathy that they're talking about when they say there's a disturbance in the force they can feel these emotions um, affecting that. So, again, another thing tied to witchcraft and mysticism, the occult. And then uh, clairvoyancy. Clairvoyance is a type of mediumship or psychic ability which involves an extension of the normal range of visible perception. Ways clairvoyance may be applied. One is to see the past, present, and future. And then, you know, finding property and people, mind reading, all this stuff. Um, precognition. Future sight, second sight. Uh, okay. So, from this thing called how to develop your psychic abilities, they talk about use a pendulum, practice some form of meditation. <laughs> well, you know what's interesting? They say that requires you to to quiet your mind for at least short periods of time each day. This may be recitation of Hindu mantras, Catholic prayers like the rosary, or taking yoga classes. Oh, unreal, man. Um, why don't you guess why Catholic prayers and Hindu mantras are in the same category for doing meditation? Anyways, learn to read tarot cards. Nope. Open your mind to the idea of communicating with spirits. So this is all for the developing psychic abilities thing. The reason I'm talking about that is the if you haven't uh, the the force thing. Um, if you haven't brought in the Hollywood hype and are comfortable with using Ouija board, no, I'm not. Go back and watch my video. By the way, I'm probably going to redo that video. I started doing that video and then I got interrupted. I had to do a second part about Ouija boards. Uh, the Untold History. I'm going to have to redo that with um, in this format. But anyways, for now, you can go back and watch that about Ouija boards. See the danger of that. And, um, they say it can be a good tool for making contact with spirits. Automatic writing. Another good method. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. So anyways... What is what is the deal with that? I don't know. Anyways, let's read this uh, scripture. Deuteronomy 18, verse 9. When thou art come into the land when the Lord, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, we're, by the way, we're almost at the end, which Lord God, thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you any one that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire or that useth divination or an observer or of times or an enchanter or a witch or a charmer or a consulter with familiar spirits or a wizard or a necromancer for all that do these things are an abomination of the Lord and because of these abominations the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee now some of you might be saying well why does this you know this is from the Old Testament why was, does this still apply to people today? It doesn't apply to people today in the New Testament. Yes, it does. And if you go to Galatians chapter 5, you will see witchcraft mentioned as a work of the flesh, as a sin. You will all, you, it says, they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. It also says in the book of Revelation, it speaks against people that do sorcery and that sorcerers, have their part in the lake of fire. Sorcery, witchcraft, the occult is spoken against over and over and over again. But here, it specifically says divination is one of the occultic practices forbidden. So you don't use... All this is forbidden. Communicating with spirits, tarot cards, pendulum, all that stuff. The Jedi were also able to influence and control the minds of others by making use of the Jedi mind trick. 
who is also a rapper. But anyways, Jedi Mind Trick, Obi-Wan uses this type of ability when he and Luke Skywalker first arrive in Mos Eisley in A New Hope and they are stopped by stormtroopers. Using the Force, Obi-Wan convinces the stormtrooper that these aren't the droids you're looking for. And he's like, yeah, these aren't the droids you're looking for. Okay, goodbye. And he was controlling his mind. Okay, so this is a psychic ability thing. Uh, the Sith, who are supposed to be the evil, right? The Sith use... An ability called Force Lightning, which is a lightning-like manifestation of the dark side of the Force that can be used either in combat or as an instrument of excruciating torture, as demonstrated by Emperor Palpatine in Return of the Jedi and Revenge of the Sith, Count Dooku in Attack of the Clones. Darth Vader also demonstrates the ability to choke using the Force, and numerous Jedi have been able to manipulate their lightsaber with the Force. The Force also gives enhanced skills and lightsaber combat. All right. Now, what? this is an important point. Please uh, listen to this about white magic. Okay. Star Wars promotes the same lie that white magic and black magic, by the way, I'm spelling it M-A-G-I-C-K, that that type of spelling is used to differentiate between stage magic, which is people doing magic tricks, pulling a rabbit on the hat, and what we're talking about, which is witchcraft. Okay. But the Star Wars promotes the same lie that white magic and black magic are different. And that white magic is good. They promote a light and dark side of the force. The problem is that even in the movie, they acknowledge that the light and dark side use the same force. They get their power from the same force. They just use it in different ways. They say it's still part of the same force. Oh, but there's a dark side and the good and the good side. No. And it's the same thing that they say, you know, like I said, in witchcraft, white magic and black magic. It's like, okay, white magic is just people that are like, well, I don't, you know, want to do focus on hexing people and sacrificing animals or whatever it is. But they're still messing around with the same energy, same forces, same spirits. They're just doing different things. But they get it from the same force. That's what it teaches in Star Wars. The Bible makes no distinction between white and black magic. All magic, witchcraft, and occult practices are condemned in the Bible. As I said, Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. Which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft. Of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past... That they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God, will not go to heaven. And Revelation 21.8, But the fearful and unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the whoremongers, the sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. Don't die twice. Uh, but witchcraft, sorcery, it's condemned over and over in the Bible. Absolutely condemned. Uh, last thing is this. This is interesting, actually. Uh, Force Ghost. The first instance of a dead character communicating with a living character occurs soon after Obi-Wan Kenobi's death in A New Hope. When Luke Skywalker hears Obi-Wan's voice saying, Run, Luke, run! Luke hears Obi-Wan's voice again during the Battle of Yavin. The first visual appearance of a force ghost or force spirit is in The Empire Strikes Back when Obi-Wan's ghost appears to Luke on Hoth and again to Luke and Yoda on Dagobah. In Return of the Jedi, Luke con converses with the ghost of Dagobah after Yoda's death, then sees their two spirits alongside that of Anakin Skywalker during the celebration at, on Endor at the end of the film. Okay, uh, and by the way, talking to the dead and all that stuff, uh, go watch my another video I have called Can You Talk to the Dead? And um, I show that, you know, there's when people die, there is no in-between realm. There's no such things as ghosts, like, that's not actually spirits of dead people, but that unclean spirits, familiar spirits, devils, can impersonate dead relatives even their voices and their appearance that's not actually dead relatives but anyways 
Go watch that video for more on that. But we talk about here, we're talking about Endor. Okay, so there was there was a celebration on Endor, this place in Star Wars. Why'd they call it Endor? Well, first Samuel chapter twenty one I'm sorry, first Samuel twenty eight seven from the Bible, then said Saul unto his servants, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. And guess what? He went to the witch at Endor. Now, how come in the Bible, the one place we know it's called Endor is a place where Saul goes to see the woman with the devil. He goes to see the witch of Endor. Why did uh, George Lucas name it Endor? Why did they call it Endor? I don't know. What about the Alpha Lodge? Look into that. All right, Deuteronomy 18, 10, 11. There shall not be found among you any that does all these things or consulted with familiar spirits or a necromancer. What's a necromancer? Someone who tries to talk to the dead. Leviticus 19, 31. Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. Do not seek after them with familiar spirits or wizards. Leviticus 20, verse 6, And the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits, and after wizards to go a-whoring after them, I will even set my face against that soul and will cut him off from among his people. And then finally, Acts 19, 19, which says, Many of them also which used curious arts, they, used the, they were into the occult, brought their books together, their occult books, and burned them before all men, and they counted the price of them, and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. There's the end of the notes. Uh, but yeah, they burned all the occultic books. So there's a lot against uh, witchcraft, sorcery, all types of divination, occultic practices in the Bible. They're specifically condemned. And it's not for no reason. It's it's dangerous. And you're dealing with the devil. At the end of the day, you're dealing with the devil and his angels, and that's it. That is what you're dealing with. You might not want to believe that. You might want to scoff at it, mock it. But it's the truth. And so, you've been given quite a bit of information today, which uh, shows that to you. And we see that, pretty simple, as I said at the beginning, that Star Wars teaches this concept of the Force, this universal life force energy, and that it's in multiple different religions and occult practices. And it doesn't matter that it uses a bunch of different names. It's all the same thing. And then I show the danger of it, and we see the Kundalini Awakening. That's something very, very insane and something you don't want to mess with. And then we saw the parallels between that and possession and that it's, it shows that the energy is actually devils and that a lot of the practice, it, it, it's all the, the things that the Jedis do is witchcraft and that messing around with this energy is witchcraft and it's all condemned by God. And that kind of summarizes all of it. Alrighty, well... I think we'll stop there because not much more to say on this for now. If you got any more questions, send me an email, treadingserpents at hotmail.com. Other than that, thank you for watching and listening. Hope this was helpful to you. Please consider it. And don't just um, instantly dismiss. Think about it for a little bit. And go look in the resources. Uh, go look at the, the sources. And, and look it up yourself. But thank you for watching. Please like, share, subscribe, and um, check out the description. Subscribe to the Telegram channel and other things like that. And uh, God bless you. Have a good day.